And ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution is not going to get that man today. No, because I'm going to get him. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report, a very special broadcast for you, this this broadcast, my goodness. Uh, Tom Horn, Skywatch TV, of course, skywatchtv.com. Steve Quayle, stevequayle.com, true legends of the series.com. You know, watching these two gentlemen on parallel paths conduct their research and investigation, and suddenly an intersection takes place, my goodness. An intersection that, uh, that brings forth, bears forth much fruit. Tonight, you're in for a real treat. The intellectual prowess of both in, in, both men and the um, fruit of the research. Tom Horn, of course. Uh, uh, well, just go to HagmanReport.com and click on the link for tonight's show. It's all there. All of the links, everything you need, it's all centralized. One page. It'll take you to Steve's. It'll take you to Tom's. And uh, the trailers are there. Uh, I can't wait for uh, to get my hands on a copy of, of uh, Abaddon Ascending as well, of course. I'm going to kick it off to Steve Quayle. Steve, thanks so much for uh, being a part of tonight's broadcast, and Tom, uh, you as well. But Steve, go ahead and kick it off, sir. Well, I think it's important tonight for everyone to put into perspective that uh, Tom and I individually, and for for the last 10 plus 10, 15 years, have been pretty much led on parallel paths, independent of each other. And just in the last uh, couple years, our our research is really coming to a crescendo, our mutual research, and it came to a, I would guess, almost like a hub dug in the middle of the uh, Four Corners region of the United States in the desert southwest. And what's fascinating is the, the, uh, I guess you'd say, the anointing and the appointing is been upon Tom Horn's life, as well as mine, is to prepare the people of God for that which they do not see, have yet to be uh, fully aware of, maybe have only sat on the peripheral, but that's going to affect, uh, excuse me, uh, affect everyone's life and cause a massive quantum shift in their thinking and their life experiences, and that everything we have known as normal is going to change. Now, with Tom's recent uh, uh, book and his recent uh, articles that are being uh, placed on his site, Skywatch TV News, you know, we're talking about Abaddon uh, ascending, and we're also talking about the powers of heaven being shaken. So we're dealing with uh, unusual circumstances that were hidden from the church's eyes and understanding until the time that uh, the people would be ready to uh, receive it also and to experience it. So tonight, Tom and I are going to cover a lot of territory, and we're going to go back and forth as we always do. And we're so excited for those of you that have supported us in in buying our DVDs and buying our mutual books and absolutely praying for us and, and believing in us, because here's the thing. We're bringing, I would say, stuff advanced into your, or advanced stuff into your knowledge and your understanding as radar. A lot of people don't realize that the radar blips start far out, but as they get closer and closer, the effects of that which is on the radar or, you know, Planet X, Nibiru or whatever, but all these events, the cosmic events, the cosmic wars now are centering on Earth. So we're in, I would say this, the most uh, precipitous and perilous times that we've ever uh, experienced on the Earth, nor would, as the prophet Daniel declared it. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom, then we'll go back and forth. And Tom, when you're done or want any, uh, you know, uh, break, uh, just throw it back to me. God bless you, sir. Hey, uh, great to be with you guys again, Doug, uh, Joe, uh, Steve, and thanks for having me on the show. It was such an honor uh, to be here tonight. And uh, I just wanted to say one thing real quickly before we get started. A thank you, uh, Steve, to you and also Doug and Joe uh, Hagman, uh, because the last time I was on your program, uh, Doug, you know, you and Steve did that fun for a pony uh, thing. Nita was on with us for about an hour. Uh, and uh, we sent people over to the website to click on the Sponsor Pony link, and some people did go over there, and they, they helped us raise some money, and I'm bringing all this up to say thank you, but also to say thank you to the people that listened to the program that sponsored a pony. It was Steve Quayle's idea. I gave him credit for it on television uh, since then, and we were able to raise enough money, and Nita and I paid for the balance on this to buy all the material to build the outside, to get all the excavating done, to put in the foundation, the, the, the wells, the... Uh, septic systems, the infrastructure, and all of the material to put up the outside of the new building that will be used to house the Royal Family Kids Camp. So I'm not going to go back into all that. If people want to go into the archives on Hagman and Hagman, we talked about Royal Family, what that's about, these overlooked children that wind up in the system, and why we felt uh, that this would be, me and Nita's, basically our retirement mission in life. <laughs> Although, Steve, like you, I, I've, you know, I've tried to retire so many times, but now it's just like a big joke, right? Uh, but, but people did respond to that. We wanted to say thank you for responding uh, to that. We're going to be doing some things for the Sponsor of Pony people. We're going to pay for their registration. 
uh, into our conference this coming year. We're going to have a banquet in their honor in which we're going to show them all the stuff that we were able to do. Uh, we're going to have uh, a private invitation-only retreat at Whispering Ponies Ranch for the people that sponsor ponies. So if people want to know more about that, they can go to the website and click on Sponsor Pony and read about what that was all about. It was Steve Quayle's idea. It turned out to be a great idea. And I just one of the ones listening to this show that, that, that heard it last time and responded how much we appreciate uh, what you did and the Hagman for hosting it and Steve Quayle for having a great idea uh, because this is directly ministering to children who need it the most, and we are very, very, uh, very thankful that you were willing to do that. So I just wanted to say that before we get started. Um, you know, Steve, you, you mentioned the fact that uh, a, a lot of stuff came to a head recently in the four corners of the United States most recently. Uh, only one picture so far has been posted that shows me in a, uh, you know, in a big escalade out in the middle of the Valley of the Gods. What people don't know, uh, there's the film crew there from uh, the people that do the History Channel's Mountain Man. Great guys. You hired you know, the top in the world to come. But you did because what we're going to be talking about, uh, not so much tonight, after the first of the year, because we still have to confirm a few things, as you know. Um, but we just want people to put this on their radar right now. It will, without doubt, be the biggest thing that Tom Horn and Steve Quayle have ever done together. Timothy Alberino is also involved, but we had a whole, uh, a whole fleet of investigators, private investigators, film crews. We've met with the Hopi leaders, with the Zuni leaders. People are going to want to know what is this all about. Why are we likely going to get a sit-down even with curators from the Smithsonian Institution? Well, people will know we can't really let the cat out of the bag yet because we're having to verify some of this stuff. But we are working on it diligently and hope to be back uh, by the end of the year or right after the first of the year to start uh, spilling the beans on what's going to happen. This will, uh, for the listeners, by the way, this will be the first time that we've ever published uh, a, a book that is by Steve Quayle and Tom Horn. We've heard for years how people are waiting on that. Well, this discovery mandated it, but there's also going to be a Gen 6 documentary film. And Steve, if I don't shut up, I'm probably going to slip and say things I shouldn't say. Just, I just want to tell people, uh, man, there is some big, major, exciting, but also scary uh, kind of stuff that is coming. And uh, so I'll, I'll let you maybe later talk some more about that. Um, on, the, on, the, on the book, Abaddon Impelled to Do This, it does have a lot to do with CERN, but it actually has to do with a lot more than just CERN. We spent a great deal of time over the last year documenting the fact that we've never seen a time in which there is so much dark occultism. Uh, Steve, I don't know the, ter the term you used a minute ago, but warfare that is focused on planet Earth. Um, in, a, in the history of our nation, we've never seen anything like it before. Uh, and it's, and it's full spectrum, all the way from the Satan clubs that are opening up on grade school uh, grounds across the na nation to the uh, Baphomet satanic statues that are being erected on public grounds and proposed for public grounds like in Oklahoma and Detroit and elsewhere. Um, but you ratchet it up, and recently a satanic sacrifice that was called a parody, but that was either way, parody or not, was performed by CERN employees in front of the Shiva statue right there at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and even if, by the way, it was a parody, uh, all occultists know that parody holds power, rituals hold power. Uh, but, it, of course, it could have been more than just a parody. And then you had the all-day-long Gothard Base Tunnel satanic ceremony in Switzerland that was literally mind-boggling that was attended uh, by government officials. And then the... Uh, sorry, I dropped something on my stuff there. The, the thing that freaks me out, I think, the most, and that I would really want people to think about, is this bizarre WikiLeaks revelation involving uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman, John Podesta, and his brother, and God only knows who all else in the U.S. government, that were either involved with or their friends are involved with things like spirit cooking. Uh, and you guys probably have done shows on this already. I mean, it's, it's, the, most, it's the most disgusting, but more than disgusting, satanic. Uh, the, the public has no idea where this is coming from, and what uh, the full measure of this is all about. The disgusting aspect, of course, you know, using menstrual blood and semen and urine and breast milk and all these male and female body parts uh, and, uh, you know, fluids that are being used in artwork and torture porn. And again, at least parody human sacrifices, but I suspect at least in some places more than parody. Um, this, this is literally, uh, 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 Doug and, and Steve, this is what your friend Alex Jones called the most bizarre WikiLeaks revelation to date, where you have these Clinton campaign people like Podesta 
being invited to this spirit cooking dinner by the performance artist, she's a Satanist, Marina Abramovic. She says she's not, but she is. Uh, inviting them to take part in these occult rituals. This, these were actually founded by Aliaster Crowley, uh, and, and we can maybe go into some of that. Uh, but this, this woman, who is most assuredly demonically possessed and demonically controlled, is also a darling to the occult elite, to the Hollywood elite, and evidently now we know to some of the U.S. government elite uh, because of her emails to John Podesta's brother. Uh, and, and by the way, besides the, the occultism, these guys are also alien believers in the most demonic sense of the word. Numerous of their emails uh, between Podesta and other government and entertainment types and even Vatican uh, insiders uh, talking about uh, how we're moving towards an official disclosure moment that they suggested is, com- is coming this uh, coming year, 2017. Um, but, uh, but it was this Marina who had emailed uh, John's brother in June saying, I'm looking you know, forward to the spirit coaching dinner at her place. Do you think you're going to be able to attend? And then uh, Tony Podesta, John's brother, forwards the email to his brother John uh, and says, are you going to be in New York City on a certain day? Marina wants you to come to her house for dinner. Well, this is very intimate language. It's, you know, if, you, if you've never met somebody, you don't get an email from your brother saying, hey, Marina wants to know if you were going to come to her house for dinner. That's all very intimate language, meaning this has happened before. Uh, so uh, now, did you guys do any programs on this, by the way? Yes, Tom, and uh, I've got eight, over 800 pages of current research, and next week we, we are slated to dedicate uh, uh, a number of segments to our new findings because, Tom, it gets so – it's even deeper. It, it goes it goes into uh, uh, U.K. royalty. It goes back to Jimmy uh, Sav- uh, Savile. It goes to um, a number of things, and you can even trace it back as far as the Franklin scandal. Yeah, well, this is now- well, hey, Doug. Yes, sir. And, and, hey, Tom, let me interject one thing right here. I believe this is a fulfillment of the word of the Lord that God was going to reveal to the people the sins of our leaders. But I also believe that God is showing that, that the devil is the God, little g, of this world. When you're dealing with all of the child sacrifice and the child cannibalism and all of the perversion, everything that we're dealing with, I believe that God is totally going to and is, I want to make that statement again, God is totally going to and and is unmasking the total facade that has bewitched, bedeviled, and basically seduced the people of the planet to think that the leaders of this world are somehow benevolent. Now, when Nancy Pelosi's Goat Hill Pizza restaurant, you know, uh, was opened up, you've got to see the common denominator between all of these uh, uh, entities. Nancy Pelosi obviously is uh, is one of the forerunners in the Democratic Party, but also everything that is absolutely horrible disgusting, vile, wretched, putrid, uh, vomitous, uh, uh, cesspoolish, there's another word. The point is, is it all comes back to the one central theme. And Doug, I hope in your 800 pages and your continuing investigation, people understand this. Blood lust, I want to make this clear, is the appetite of supernatural evil entities called demons that inhabit human beings. And as the human beings give in more and more to the demonic cravings, appetites, and uh, uh, sensual feelings, they see cease to be. And Tom, I don't know if you know this, but I think I've used it with you when we've been on Skywatch TV programs or, or, or other radio shows, but I am I'm no longer even referring to them as human beings. I do not believe they are human beings. I believe that when the human spirit is so given over that they literally become not just they, they're no longer uh, uh, guilty of sin, but they become the very sin they embrace. And so I call them entities. And when you and I get into CERN, uh, you know, whenever we do that and what's going on, please go back to Goat Hill. But there's a reason that even CERN's, uh, you know, biggest magnet is being named Goliath. Goliath was a historic giant. All of these symbols, all of these statements, all of these images, all of these news releases, all of the breaking Guccifer or WikiLeaks are pointing to the whole world lies in the evil one. And somehow, Doug, my prayer is after tonight's show is that Christians are going to understand that even as the battle for, for the presidency and all of the associated issues with that, that ain't, and don't get me wrong, it's critically important, but what is coming, Jesus said, if he told us earthly things and, and we believe him not, how can he tell us heavenly things? And that's what I hope, Tom, that you and I can bring out 
to people today because Abaddon is ascending. So uh, continue on. I just want to make sure people understand that. This is not a little issue, ladies and gentlemen. I'll put it in quail terms. This is a volcanic explosion equal to all the volcanoes in the world simultaneously going off at once in the realm of supernatural evil being laid out before your eyes and ears, and those who claim or lay claim to Christianity are totally clueless and still trying to decide if, as a good Christian, they can vote for Donald Trump or not. You better go beyond that and ask God, and I'll say this at the beginning before we we really get going, Tom, and I really get wound up and you really get going, <laughs> is, the fact, is the fact that this is unlike anything that has ever been. This is like unlike anything that will ever be except that which it comes into our understanding, and the heart of man cannot even begin to understand or wrap their brains around what is getting ready to happen. And that's what your calling is, if I might speak for you, knowing you as well as I do, and my calling is, is to get the people to understand this is not some giant crap table. These are not just uh, dice being thrown, you know, uh, bouncing off uh, or going through black holes and, and, and bouncing off gravitational waves, you know. This is all by design. And the, uh, the last thing I want to draw is the cannibalism now that's even being announced by some Muslims, although more are embracing it, that it's okay to eat Christians. I'm talking eat, you know, like yummy, yummy, yummy. They got Christians in their tummy. And I'm not trying to be sinister there, you know, uh, sarcastic, but this is sinisterly wicked stuff. And so, you know, it's time basically to grow the heaven up. I'll use a better word, and let uh, hell grow, uh, uh, how do I say this, flee before the presence of the Lord, but people had better understand this. This is the biggest thing in the history of the world that's been hidden from even the prophets who longed, who saw parts of it, but now the people who are born for such a time as this, people that will take their authority of Jesus and be, uh, how do I say this, concerned for their fellow men, uh, there's that CERN word, concerned for their fellow men, uh, it's time for them to step up to the pump. Go ahead. Well, Absolutely. Look, here, here's the thing. Uh, you know, we probably are going to jump all around tonight, but it all actually ties together because if we're talking about CERN and we're talking about the satanic parody that they were illustrating at CERN, if we're talking about the Gothard Tunnel uh, uh, satanic, all day long satanic ritual that was attended by so uh, some of the elite that uh, Doug was referring to uh, a moment ago, uh, but and yet also it depicts cannibalism, orgiastic sex with animals. Goat man, Fernunos coming up out of the underworld, giving birth to another goat man who becomes the god of the world, and then finally gives birth to the core of Babylon. At first, it only it only looks like these are disparate issues, but they're actually not, because as people are going to learn after the first of the year, we are part of why were we in uh, the four corners? Well, let's just say that in the ancient times, when the gates opened the last time, uh, ultimately it led to the corn and man meat meals, cannibalism, uh, some of the evidence that we have. And the six-fingered, six toe well, again, I'm, I'm going to say things that I shouldn't say, but, but cannibalism was a part of uh, what was going on then as these gates begin opening again, and CERN is not making any secret about the fact that that is exactly what they are trying to do, uh, then we would expect that their parodies, their, their sing-song to the demons of the underworld, uh, is depicting this kind of stuff like spirit dinners and the consumption of human byproducts because this is the satanic order. When, they, when the Nephilim came the first time, they were cannibals. When they come the next time, they're cannibals. This is what they are. This is what they do. Um, now, if you're in Christ, then, you know, God puts his seal on your forehead and he orders these plagues not to touch you. But if you're listening to this program and you're not in Christ, or you mock us, or you think this is not real, um, then our, our prayers are with you. Uh, because this is Satanism of the highest order. And now it isn't just the, the Alex Jones discovery of what's going on in the Redwood Forest every year beneath, uh, you know, a giant owl where they mimic the uh, death of uh, uh, Abram's son. Uh, but now we're talking about people who actually get together and actually consume uh, uh, body parts. This is right out of Thelema. This is Ali Astor Crowley. This is his uh, uh, libel, whatever he called it, the Book of the Law. Uh, uh, this is an occult performance, the, the purpose of which is to prepare people for agonizing pain, torture, and consumption. That's why, Marina, if you, and I don't recommend anybody do this, by the way, but if you watch the, the YouTube video where she's doing the so-called uh, painting part of the spirit dinner, that's why she's stabbing, she stabs herself in the hand, and she talks about taking a sharp knife and cutting it deeply in the middle of your finger and left hand, and then eat the pain. Get used to that, right? Uh, but this has, its, uh, this has its origin in very old occultic rituals that were performed before consuming Eucharistic meals, wafers. That's what the, the, the satanic side of this, if you, if you read, and I did a long time ago, uh, the, the Book of the Law, the book that Ali Astor Crowley uh, published, a lot of this really is for the black mass. In, 
in which the body and blood of Jesus Christ is mocked and blasphemed because they derive power uh, from this. So, folks, think about what I'm saying. We're talking about the, the uh, campaign director and other people involved with the Clinton administration getting caught, not with their fingers in the cookie jar, getting caught with their fingers in human blood, uh, performing the most blasphemous, the most horrific, the most terrible satanic rituals. Uh, and um, I don't know, uh, Joe, I mean, uh, Doug, I don't know, you know exactly when you're going to be done with your, your material, but I have got to get my hands on it because I also know that this ceremony is meant to create a union between man and supernatural entities, what you, they're trying to do. To Tom, Tom, I'll hold that thought. We're up against the bottom of the hour here, but I want to say this. You had mentioned Thelema. Folks, if you do not, and Tom, I don't know if you know this, but if you take the, and I've downloaded, we have on a separate uh, uh, the hard drive, all of the Podesta emails, we've done a word search, and Thelema does come up in the subject line. I'm not going to get into it uh, with at this point because you have to understand the context. But yes, you are 100% correct, Tom, that this does get into that that very specific, um, archaic, spiritual, black ma- magic, black mass, uh, summoning of demons. Folks, you're listening to Tom Horn, Steve Quayle. Stay right where you're at. I'll be right back. Two gentlemen that are on the cutting edge of everything that's current and everything that is in the past. Almost the uh, well, the ancient. Uh, my goodness, the the, the the things of antiquity, how it relates to the Bible accounts, and how even more importantly or equally important, uh, the current events. Steve Quayle from SteveQuayle.com and TrueLegendsTheSeries.com, and of course Tom Horn, the esteemed gentleman from SkywatchTV.com, uh, Abaddon Ascending. You've got, to, you've got to take a look at uh, at skywatchtv.com and, and also hagmanreport.com. It'll take you right over there. Back to Steve Quayle and Tom Horn. Spirit cooking, yes, indeed. The Lima, Alistair Crowley, it all connects. Abaddon ascending. I'm going to kick it back to Steve. Go ahead, Steve, and then uh, take it where you will with uh, Tom. Well, we've become uh, the vampire nation. And, uh, you know, the spirits, here's the thing that I think that people don't put into context. Jesus gave us an amazing word. He said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all, A-L-L, the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But if you don't understand who your enemy is, if you don't understand what you're up against, if you basically are too timid or too uh, 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 lazy to understand what spiritual warfare is, then you really need, that's a God issue. Tom and I can't help you with that, but what we can help you with is giving you the tapestry that the Lord has given us different threads uh, to draw together amongst other researchers. But look, our research is different than anyone else's, and I'll say it this way, because we both have a mandate to basically share what God has opened up to us, the favor that God has given with us different with different people, Doug, around the world. And ladies and gentlemen, listening in, when well, last time I was on with Tom, we got phone calls, I got phone calls and emails from all over the place saying, you need to come to Australia, you need to come to New Zealand, you need to come to the Solomon Islands, you need to come, you need to come, you need to come. And by the grace of God, we'll go where the Lord leads us. But when we, and Dom, I'm just going to give a little bit. I'm just going to give a couple of wet your whistle issues, okay? okay? When we went to the desert southwest and with our film crews and and uh, meeting with the different uh, Native Americans, uh, both on this trip and the ones that Tom had met with on his previous trip, it became obvious that the subject matter of giants, the subject matter of pyramids, the subject matter of evil spirits, the subject matter of not only fallen angels, but the cohabitation of the fallen angels, and, and what People still, even today, Doug, or yesterday, forgive me, yesterday I got an email, guys saying, you don't know what you're talking about. Angels don't have sex. They live in heaven. Oh, really? Well, especially the ones that, uh, you know, were fallen angels, they didn't stay in their first estate. But getting beyond all that, what we confirmed and had confirmed for us that absolutely the Native Americans know where the bones of the giants are at. Absolutely they believe in stargates, and I won't go any further than that, Tom. But let me just say this. There's a reason why the U.S. military put out Native American sacred sites. There's a reason why they did it in an an, uh, analytical and logical uh, progression to explain something. There's a reason why military bases are built on uh, former giant or cyclopean tunnels. One of the things that was fascinating is when uh, we did the Unholy Sea, and everything leads from South America into Rome, and 
then from Rome, it leads back into the desert southwest and into the Aztec, the Inca, and the Maya, and all of the uh, corresponding imagery, the corresponding legends, the truth. What God is doing, Doug, is simply this. It's now his time to expose the lies that the people on earth believe. Now, I believe God is doing this for two reasons. Number one, he's revealing the true spiritual wickedness in not only heavenly places, but earthly subservient uh, uh, places of power. And Tom, I think you should go into, if you would, the CERN tunnel ceremony a little bit, because you've got to, and this is not flattery, it's just an honest statement, you've got an understanding of that that absolutely goes beyond what most people can embrace. And then, you know, ladies and gentlemen, if we were to tell you this, that simultaneously, worldwide, all of these events are taking place in different languages, different cultures, but in, in essence, it's like somebody sent them out, and these are people that don't, uh, I'm not on Twitter, but it's imagine that, that there's a mass uh, mailing or whatever you call it, email, what's the word, Doug, where people send out everything and tell them to do this or whatever, when a flash mob or crash mob, whatever, but imagine that's being done by hell, and all of the adherence to hell all of the priests of hell, all of the Satanists, all of the animists are all coming to the gathering. And that gathering is a total war on Jesus Christ, the believers of the living God. And when I hear, and I'm going to say, no, I won't say that at this point. I'll hold that until later. But when I hear the bleeding heart, leftist liberals who try and lay claim to Christianity, uh, uh, explain this stuff away, or that somehow I'm a fear monger or purveyor of porn, let me share this with you. If someone were to read my emails, and I've threatened to do it, I think I'll do it. I'll always protect the uh, uh, identity of the people, always, not tell them the real name or I'll just put their initials. But the thing is, is there are a lot of terrified Christians, exclusive of listening to me or Tom Horn or you, Doug, that are having encounters worldwide. And when I say they're over the top, even with what I know, and I admire and I pray, and I pray that everyone will pray for the men and women who have deliverance ministries to set the captives free, because that's not a condition of, uh, you know, just the elite of believers. That's a commandment that we're to preach the kingdom of God. Now, having said that, when we were all in the desert southwest, we had uh, a Additional information given to us, and we had, uh, uh, what would you say, Tom, collaborating uh, evidence given to us, and we saw firsthand the cover-up. I will say this, and because, you know, because they ducked out on us, one of the most famous archaeological finds in Crow Canyon, the minute they found out that Tom and I were who we were, and uh, you know, was given, they were given some of our writings, uh, they ducked out quicker than you could, uh, you know, a moth would, uh, uh, just, uh, what would you say, be drawn to a, a, a light, okay? They wanted nothing thing to do with it. So, Tom, go ahead and take it, well, if you would, from this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's absolutely true. There were those who, who ducked out, um, because, but their uh, report has been published on the university website. We've got the rights to be able to republish parts of that. And what was it that they found? They found unusually large bones that had six fingers, six toes, distorted mandibles, lion-like teeth, two rows of teeth. So we found basically the Minimo lab here in the four corners. The other thing was we learned from, and these the, the Hopi and the Zuni that we met with, people are going to learn, these were not, uh, what would you call them, uh, you know, low scale. Uh, these were governors of tribes. These were leaders. These were tribal elders. These were tribal medicine men. Uh, and at one time even pointed, well, this is probably going to be in your documentary, so I won't say, but they pointed to a specific area. They told us this is where the bones are. Uh, they're protecting those bones. They also admitted to us, that we've now entered into the time that those bones are going to be reanimated. And so I do want to get into that, but I have got to, uh, you know, Doug, uh, before we went to the break, took me up to this point on, on Salima, and I, I, a couple of thoughts I jotted down during the commercial, and it's actually related to this. And, and I think I can put this together so people will understand how these ancient gateways, these ancient giants, uh, are related to the forthcoming gateways and the efforts on the part of the highest level occultists to open these doorways. That's exactly what they're trying to do. Go and watch the Gothard Tunnel uh, Ceremony, the parts of it that you can see on YouTube. Notice the giant spinning vortex, but also notice at one point they actually put the symbol of CERN up in that vortex. They show it spinning, and then all of a sudden the giant awakens from under the earth. Pretty soon they're coming through into our reality. This is exactly what they are trying to do. They're trying to repeat the sin of the watchers. But is this any uh, surprise? No, because the Bible tells us that's exactly what would happen, as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. Open the gate, ye ruler, Isaiah. God speaks through Isaiah. Open the gate, plural, ye ruler. I give command, and I bring them. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. Revelation 9, a, 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 an angel comes down to the earth with the key to the bottomless pit. He opens it up, and up out of the earth come these torturous insectoids, and they have a king over them who is called Abaddon, and in his Greek tongue is known as 
Apollyon or Apollo. That's the, the whole purpose behind the book Abaddon Ascending, and what in the world does it have to do with CERN, and what in the world does it have to do uh, with uh, what we're talking about tonight? And by the way, uh, I should tell people before I forget, uh, I have a secret for Hagman and Hagman listeners tonight. If they go to skywatchtv.com, they go see that giant ad up on the top of our webpage. It says it's the biggest giveaway in the history of Skywatch TV, and it is. If people are going to buy the book Abaddon Ascending, make sure you click on that ad. Do it tonight. Don't wait, because we unhit uh, the opportunity for that to be purchased in the store uh, today, and we are giving away $400 worth of stuff when people buy that book from us. We're talking about DVDs, books, Bible software, audio sets. It's, we've never done anything like this before. Hagman and Hagman are the first people to know about it. We unhit it tonight. If you click on that and go there, if you're going to buy the book, if you're not going to buy it, then don't worry about it. But if you are, then that's bigger than any Cyber Monday sale you're going to find it anywhere. It's literally $400 worth of stuff we've never given away before, so go check that out. But what has this got to do with Salima and the Book of the Law uh, and, and, and the Podesta emails and what these occultists are trying to do with the doorways that they're trying to open? Well, Aliaster Crowley himself admits that he wrote down by dictation the Book of the Law. I wish I could remember the full title. It's Libel something or another. I can't think of the name of it, but uh, the Book of the Law, as it was dictated to him by a demon by the name of Awa and some other what he calls Salemic deities, knew it and hate it, and I forget who the other ones are. Uh, and in there, he refers to these, uh, these spirit dinner cakes. They also call them cakes of light, and their ingredients. And if you read the Book of the Law, you'll see where uh, this, uh, uh, this woman who was emailing Podesta uh, this female Satanist, you'll see where she was getting her ingredients from because they're all spelled out in there. But what's worse, and this is the part now where this gets creepy, and I want to say a couple things, and then I want to ask you, Doug, if maybe you also went into this, or Steve, if you have. Um, but in the in the book of the law, uh, in uh, like the third chapter, the 20th verses, somewhere in there, uh, he starts talking about where are you going to get this blood? How do you use this blood for the ritual? Well, he talks about the best blood is the blood of the moon monthly, meaning menstrual blood, a woman's cycle. Uh, but then he says, or the fresh blood of a child, or the blood of your enemy, or the blood of a priest, or of worshippers, and so on. Now, this, uh, this Marina, this friend of Podesta's, uh, you know, stabbing herself in the hands is only the beginning. There's a performance in which she, she pulls out her fingernails, toenails, cuts off her hair, throws them into a flaming five-star, uh, a five-pointed star, which we know what that is, then jumps inside of the fire, and she's so demonically possessed that she goes unconscious, and they have to save her from it. And it totally reminded me of Mark chapter 9, where the demons are, that possess this young boy are trying to kill him. And what do the parents say? They often throw him into the fire and try to kill him. This woman is so demonically possessed. So if we would look at her and say, well, okay, so what? She's a lunatic. So what is? She is a dear friend of some of the highest placed people in government, evidently, uh, in our nation. She is an absolute darling of the Hollywood elite. If you don't believe that, go to um, go to Google and type in La Mocha Gala performance, L-A-M-O-C-A. That's the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. And look at where she she's part of the, this year, 2016, the gala performance. All of these people are invited. And let me tell you, this is the A-list of Hollywood stars. You will be shocked if I send you the picture of some of the top actresses and actors that were at this uh, occult dinner. Uh, they, they dine on spaghetti that's made to look like intestines. They're eating tartar, bloody meat, and other grotesque food items at the tables, but that's not the worst part of it. All of the tables appear to have decapitated heads on the top of the tables. It's actually actors sitting underneath the tables, and their heads are stuck up through a hole, and they put the, the tablecloth uh, around them, but they're supposed to represent living, decapitated heads. And then all of a sudden, these shirtless men, they look like, you know, uh, like strip dancers or something, they come walking in. They have this, uh, this giant table, uh, and uh, it, it, it's, it's supposed to represent uh, uh, an amniotic sac. Uh, one of the other translations I read said, it's, get this, Steve, it's a covering representing the crust of the earth, under which the whore of Babylon, the scarlet woman, uh, exists. So she's either in an am, uh, amniotic sac or she's under the crust of the earth. Anyway, they carry this out in front of all of these Hollywood stars. Uh, she represents the whore of Babylon. She takes a knife and cuts her way out of this, uh, this container. Then she jumps up on stage, starts dance, dancing and gyrating. By the way, it's the, it's the singer, Debbie Harry. Uh, and uh, starts doing all this stuff. Uh, but then they carry out all these other lifelike forms of nude female bodies. And they are very uh, realistic looking. They're very lifelike looking and they're full size. They carry these nude bodies out. And uh, Debbie Harry and then Miss Marina, who is there, the, the Satanist, they take these large knives 
and they go over and they plunge these knives into the hearts of these lifelike, full renditions of nude women. They carve out their hearts and raise the hearts up over the tops of their heads. The crowd goes crazy cheering. They're cheering. Uh, and, but but, but this, this cake material has the ingredients for the spirit cooking cooked into it. It's got menstrual blood, breast milk, sperm, urine, all this crud. And, and you should see the, the Hollywood elite as they're dining on the, the sacrament of these lifelike bodies that are carved into pieces and cannibalized, and they're all applauding. I mean, the irony here is that you have all of these liberal elites who are supposed to be the champions of women's rights, right, celebrating the parody of murdering and cannibalizing these fully grown women. It's just the most god-awful, terrible, satanic thing you've ever seen in your entire life, and it's all being applauded and participated in by the, by the top people in the Hollywood. And, and I can send pictures of this to people if they want to see it, but you can go to Google and just type in a La Mocha Gala performance. You can look at this stuff yourself. It's the most disgusting thing ever. But uh, a part of this was uh, also, of course, then being illustrated in the Podesta email. So let me, but let me get back to what I was going to ask you, Doug, and, and Steve, uh, because there's something else here uh, that comes into play, and that is how the spirit cooking revelations in the Podesta email uh, also do seem to appear to contain code for child sex trafficking. And what I mean by that, as Steve, you mentioned the pizza stuff a moment ago, in those emails it mentions different types of food, uh, calling them pizza parties. Now, we know, investigators know this, I'm sure, Doug, that this is probably part of what you've done, but this is connected to Laura Silsby, the, the missionary that was jailed oh, yeah, for six Haiti. months. In Haiti. Yeah, yeah, after her organization, New Life Children Refuge, they were smuggling 33, get that, a Freemasonic number, smuggling 33 children out of Haiti, the Dominican Republic, all of that. Uh, and, and the WikiLeaks emails revealed that uh, that was happening, but also that Hillary's top aide, Huma uh, uh, Abedin, uh, had been forwarding those articles about the New uh, Life Children's Refugee to Hillary Clinton herself. Why in the world would, uh, would because, you know, the, the Clinton Foundation is under investigation. We know because of our mutual good friend, Gary Haven, he actually went down, I hope I'm not going to get in trouble by saying this, he actually went down to Haiti. No, no, hey, Tom, you can, you, can, you can say whatever you want. I just talked to Gary a couple hours ago, and, I mean, the, the disgust of, of what's going on down there, and, you know, he's been down there for five weeks straight, but you can say anything you want to say about it, but, I mean, Gary would only tell you this, that, uh, you know, when you see what people do uh, under normal starvation, uh, a situation is claw their way and kill to get food, but also the voodoo and the hold of supernatural evil on Haiti is almost unimaginable. Well, the only point that I was going to make about it, because, you know, Gary doesn't toot his own horn. He doesn't go on a radio or television and say, see what I've done. But you and I happen to know, because he was supposed to fly you in. You guys came in on a giant helicopter and met me in the Valley of the Gods and some of the other places we went in the Four Corners a month ago. Uh, and Gary was supposed to pilot you in. He couldn't do it because he's in Haiti he's paying for these transport planes, literally moving millions of dollars worth of food into the Haitians. Gary's paying for most or all of that out of his own pocket. And uh, Gary, so he, he more than many people, is fully aware of how much the Clinton Foundation has done squat after raising a whole lot of money. But, but anyway, I didn't mean to get off on that. But the point is that there is this element about uh, child trafficking and, and, a, and a serious concern about this code for child sex trafficking, which, trafficking, which is known as pizza parties. Uh, it's so disgusting. <clears throat> if you, you're talking about, I'd like an Italian pizza, you're, you're classifying the kind of a child you'd want to molest. Uh, or I want uh, a Mexican pizza with so many pieces and parts. I mean, this is terrible stuff. Uh, it's under investigation right now. And as a matter of fact, uh, this is also connected to the whole, um, uh, uh, you know, the convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. Bill Clinton, more That's than right. 20 times flying to Sex Island or whatever they call it. Hillary Clinton, we know now, was there at least six times. But our, our government is sitting on a report right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, is it going to be published or not? I don't know. I've, I've heard it's so disgusting that even the FBI is unsure whether or not this should be released. But so anyway, I, I jumped all over the place. But Doug, uh, so all these pages of material that you're set to publish, does it go into some of this stuff? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. And one of the things, uh, I'll just mention this, and I'm not exactly certain. Um, we're also looking at a couple of images that contain, well, I guess I could say it this way, a JPEG or a certain type of an image. It should be a certain file size, a certain number of, um, uh, well, it should be a certain file size. And, we i'll just say that there are a couple of images that we've downloaded that appear to be larger in file size than the picture would require or or dictate so that tells me that in the embedded within the images would be another image or or some type of coding uh, steganalysis or steganography depending on 
that, that's what we're looking at. We're, we're doing state analysis of some images, and it takes a long time, a lot of assets and resources in order to attempt to crack a code if you're hiding a picture or a text within a an image. But uh, in addition to the obvious codes, the handkerchief, uh, it's been cited by many um, uh, on the uh, counter, meaning something. The different words, yes, yes. So all of this combined. And, and I have to mention as well, there are a lot of wonderful citizen journalists out there who've been doing this on, on Reddit and 4chan. And, and uh, in fact, we're, we're going to have uh, the SGD report. Uh, we're going to have uh, some of these people on next week as well, because this is so important. It, this could bring down not just people within our government, but governments, plural, people within other governments as well. But you're right, Tom and Steve. See, you guys connected all of this long before this ever was exposed. So you guys uh, really had, and uh, props to both of you. I mean, Steve talked about this in, in different variations, and Tom, you had exposed this through your work, um, and specifically Apollyon Rising, uh, not directly, not head-on, uh, but but on, at the periphery. And when you take a look at Apollyon Rising uh, and, and uh, Zenith 2016, and you kind of distill some of that information, apply it to what we're seeing here. And Steve, with, with his research, whether it's uh, Xenogenesis or um, uh, any, well, any number of works that you've done, Genetic Armageddon, including that, um, we have we, we have some, some very interesting um, uh, interesting things that uh, pass to take, shall I say. You're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report. Two very special guests, Mr. Steve Quayle from stevequayle.com and truelegendsoftheseries.com. And Tom Horn from Skywatch TV. What a great offer. Go to skywatchtv.com and click on that the offer on the top there. Special for Hagman and Hagman listeners. Well, how gracious is he and, and how wonderful is that, especially around Christmas. We're going to be right back to right where we're at. Welcome back to Hagman and Hagman Report. I just clicked on uh, skywatchtv.com. Went to skywatchtv.com. Click on the, uh, we did your holiday shopping for you there. Biggest giveaway in Skywatch history. Tr uh, Steve, True Legends of the Series is, is, is uh, e I mean, this is really relevant to all of this that we're talking about as well. Abaddon Ascending and, 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 and all of this, everything, everything you're doing it, it, for the series and even today, what you haven't told anyone about, man, it's all, <laughs> it's, 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 this is all coming together. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Well, it is, Doug, and it's coming together for a purpose. I think with uh, the equation uh, that bringing Tom's research and my uh, research together, I'm going to be dealing with a lot of stuff I've never written about before. The stuff that Tom's going to be dealing with in his writing about is going to be, I think we're going to be somewhere between two, uh, you know, each part of the book will be 300 pages. So I think we're looking at about 600 pages total. So, you know, when, when we say it's voluminous, I know, Tom, you say the same thing I do. I said, this is the last time I'm doing this. And I've learned that the word last only applies to us and not to God. He has a sense of humor. But this is a, a major undertaking. What I'd like to share Doug, is if you look at the uh, hub on a bicycle wheel, you know, all the spokes lead right into that hub and or the nexus of it. And I think that what God is going to do with the release of the book, with the release of the uh, film, obviously documentary, is tie it all together. And if anybody's honestly looking at the stuff, and, and the quality, I'm, I'm telling you, is off the charts. Those of you who saw The Unholy Sea, and I would recommend everybody go to truelegendsaseries.com and get that. You'll need number two more than ever to understand and number three, though the information will stand alone, it's, it's, let me make it simple. All the kings of the earth in the last six months have gone to Antarctica or Patagonia. Patagonia is named Land of the Big Feet, as in giants. They're going to meet with someone who an Admiral Byrd wrote in his diary before he was sequestered out of the public eye. The most famous polar explorer in history wrote about the king of the earth living in a subterranean kingdom uh, with advanced flying craft and all sorts of uh, uh, conquering longevity, etc., etc. Now, this is a critical point that people have got to understand. The tunnels that are under the desert southwest, the tunnels that go out of the uh, Peruvian city of Cusco, the Coricancha, uh, uh, the Chincana. The Chincana is the tunnel, and the Coricancha is the uh, convent, if you will, the, gi the giant uh, cathedral over the tunnels. Why are the governments of the world so busy at covering it up? Well, they're covering it up for one reason, because giants are coming, and as you've heard Tom Horn I'll quote the Septuagint, to, to fulfill the wrath of God. And I want to read something, Tom. There's a movement in the Christian church that they're claiming that they're the army of Joel. Now, I don't pay any attention to nonsense, but someone said, do you realize that's going on? Let me tell you, it goes to Joel chapter 2, and I'm going to just read about four scriptures, you know, four verses. 
This is talking about the supernatural army of God that he releases. And let me read this. Joel chapter 2, verses 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devours a stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. Now listen to this. This is talking about the giant army that's coming. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. When they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows, okay? Uh, like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun, the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Okay, I've read that a bunch of times over my life, but I never got it until just the other day, the other morning, I felt like uh, I finally got understanding. And I felt, and take this to the Lord in prayer. I said, said, Lord, what is this all about? And he said, the genetic creations that Satan is creating and going to bring on the world scene will be met by that which I've already formed to combat them. Now, you can argue about, uh, you know, whether you believe this is true or not, but you know, how many times have you quoted Ezekiel's, uh, you know, vision of the dry bones come from the four winds of the Spirit of God and breathe upon these bones when God asks Ezekiel the question? I don't think, Tom, that most people can embrace. I know they can't, okay? The only reason we can articulate and understand and hopefully uh, help others to understand is because God's opened our eyes on this. But why is this critical? What does this have to do with salvation? The answer is everything. In the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 18, it talks about men trafficking and men's souls. I, it, it, can I say something, Doug? I, I, well, of course, I'll say it anyway. It, it sickens me that such a lackadaisical approach from mainstream, uh, you know, believianity, let's, that's a new word for me, mainstream believianity, isn't vomiting and crying out to God for his mercy, because even the human sacrifice of these little people, and I'm talking little human beings, even the blood, the gore, the cannibalism, the pizza parties with children's parts on the crust, uh, the horrific abominations that Thomas just talked, and yet, can I tell you something? There's almost relative silence as big deal. It is a big deal. It's the biggest deal in the world, and yet the, the, the people would fight. Now, someone said, well, how do you know that's not human beings? Simple. All these guys march in their own ranks. If this were talking about Christians, man, they'd be having each man's sword against his brother, and there'd be nothing but a bloodbath. But here's the thing that I think, Tom, you talked about, that's really actually pretty true. They shall run like mighty men. And you've taught through the times we've been on the radio and written about it that even Nimrod began to become a Gibarim. That's another word for a giant. Do you want to take it from here and go where you want? Look, we jump around a lot, but ladies and gentlemen, we're giving you, how do I say this, uh, uh, 6,000 years of recorded history. We're giving you 6,000 years of hidden history. We're giving you tidbits, and by the grace of God, and thank you for your prayers and your financial support, when you buy... Tom's book or my book or our DVDs or whatever, you're helping us. And, you know, it's amazing that, that we couldn't do this without, the, uh, you know, the listeners and the viewers. So I want to say uh, our heartfelt thank you. And I've got growing military guys and guys with more stars than most people believe exist telling me that they've seen some of the bravest guys fighting these things. Now, I, you challenge me on this. You take it to the Lord and say, is he telling the truth? Who said that men's hearts fail him. They've watched the toughest guys in the natural literally die of heart attacks. So, look, what's going to keep us? What's going to keep us is a super supernatural power of God. But God is a spirit of truth. And you cannot just turn your eyes apart from the slaughter, the wickedness, the horror, and, and say it doesn't matter to you. If it is, you're not my brother, and I'm not your brother. And you may ask yourself this, on Judgment Day, will Jesus say, depart from me, ye who work iniquity, I never knew you. This is serious stuff, Tom, and i, I got to say this. You know, for a certain point, maybe we were entertaining uh, to some people, maybe the mockers and scoffers and all out there, but at, at, at a very near junction in time, I'm talking very near, people's hearts will start to fail them for fear. I'm talking normal earthlings. Because this thing with Podesta, this thing with all of the gore, the Satanism, the human cannibalism, the human sacrifice, the blood vampirism, God knows, Father in heaven, I have run out of words. Only the Spirit of God can make known to people the reality of what we talk about. Go ahead, Tom, because well, what we're talking about is relevant. Yeah, and Steve, there is another uh, connection between not only the, the occultism that is connected through the WikiLeaks revelations to Hillary Clinton, the Podestas, and, and Marina, and all those people, uh, and to and Aleister Crowley in particular, uh, and to Gateways. And so now think about this, because you'll remember some of this, Steve, that it was maybe eight years ago, ten years ago, you and I were doing a whole a series of shows. Uh, and uh, and I did at the time I did some with J.R. Church and Gary Stearman, so these are up on property in the, uh, well, if they're still up there, they're still up there, but they're on YouTube. People could go and watch these to verify what we're talking about. We were just simply talking about the idea 
of you know supernatural portals, doorways, openings. Uh, how that that concept was an ancient one. Uh, gateways between our world and other dimensions, like CERN, is committed to finding that not only do they exist, but those doorways can be open, and that there are entities through which uh, they can pass. Uh, well, at, at one point uh, on those programs, it's one of the ones I was doing with Gary Stearman or, or uh, J.R. Church, uh, and, I, and I had started talking about um, Ali Astor Crowley, and, but more in particular, Jet Propulsion Laboratory founder Jack Parsons. Now, I'll tie this into Hillary Clinton in a moment, and L. Ron Hubbard, the Church of Scientology founder. Uh, and the kind of alien belief system that L. Ron, uh, L. Ron Hubbard incorporates into his Scientology, which, by the way, is neither religion nor science, but be that what it is, um, is the very kind of religion that seems to come through uh, with the Podesta emails and uh, uh, Salima and all of that. Why? Because in, in, uh, in the 1900s, Aliester Crowley, as you know, he attempts to create a dimensional vortex. He's trying to bridge a gap between our world, uh, the world of the seen and the unseen. And isn't it ironic, and I don't want to get off track here, but the occultists believe more in what the Bible talks about often than what Christians do, but that, having said that, so he's trying to open this doorway, and he, and he conducts this thing called the Amalantra working. And Crowley says he was successful. He says this presence came through after so many attempts. He's using sex magic. He's using spirit centers. He's using all the stuff that the emails are about, trying to open this doorway. And he says he creates a rift. People can go to Google and type in Lamb, L-A-M, and they can see a portrait of the, the creature that he drew. And keep in mind that this was, what, 100 years ago, 90 years ago, when he did the Amalantra working. Uh, and his uh, lamb creature looks very much like the alien grays of later pop culture. Well, so fast forward a little ways. And, and our answer, Crowley, you know, uh, L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons were students of his. They were part of the OTO and some of his religious ideas. Uh, but in a lot of ways, Crowley didn't like them. He thought they were knuckleheads. But L. Ron Hubbard, Jack Parsons, Hubbard la uh, Parsons later blew himself up. He started the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that to this day has monster contracts with the U.S. government. Uh, and, and Hubbard uh, has his monster uh, uh, associations with many of those Hollywood elite who were at the big spirit dinner consuming the nude body thing that went on at the uh, Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art this year. But, okay, so be that what it is, that you can see the connections exist. So these guys decide in 1946 that they're going to try to repeat what Aliaster Crowley had done in opening a, a doorway, a portal. And so they call their attempt the Babylon working. And they didn't spell it B-A-B-Y, they spelled it B-A-B-A, L-O-N, the Babylon working. Uh, and but the whole purpose behind this was to, through sex magic, spirit dinners, all that, to open a doorway uh, in the hopes that they would incarnate the whore of Babylon. They wanted to bring this, this demon child through, this, this uh, gibberine. And Parsons wrote that the ritual was successful, and there was a point in which this brownish-yellow light came through the doorway, and at that moment he knew, it knocked, it knocked over a candlestick and all this stuff, he writes about it in his bio, but he knew that the, you know, they had been successful. Uh, now, it's interesting that following... Uh, Crowley's magic portal, and then Parsons and Babylon's Crow, uh, work. Crowley dies in 1947. Uh, the Babylon working is done in 1946, but it ties to 1947 in a way that I'll explain in just a moment. But that's the same year that the, the uh, UFOs started appearing all over the place. Uh, they uh, crashed in Roswell, New Mexico, and our dearly departed brother, uh, 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 David Plan, wrote one of the most incredible articles ever in which he tied that, this is important, to the years 2012 through 2016. I don't think, by the way, that David Flynn was even aware uh, that those were the same years that 700-year-old Zohar prophecies, the rabbis in Jerusalem now that are talking about a messianic era, I don't think he was even aware of all that, how many seers down through history had said the same thing. A door is going to open in 2012. It's going to ultimately lead to the arrival of Antichrist in the Hebrew calendar year 5773, which started in October of this year and goes to the end of September of 2017. Um, but but here's why this is also important, um, and I'm just going to put this out there. The Babylon working explicitly stated the goal of transforming traditional values using very high dark ritual magic aimed at incarnating this archetypal divine feminine who was going to change our culture through her influence. Uh, and it's a matter of record that feminism was sown into the public con consciousness uh, from the ivy ivory towers of academia shortly uh, subsequent to Jack Parsons' dark invocations that were carried out in '46. And the Babylon working that was supposed to give birth to this magical being, this moon child, uh, Crowley uh, described it, uh, using, uh, and I don't know, Doug, if you go into this, but the, this very powerful ninth degree sex magic. This is from the Liber, um, the uh, Liber 
what is it called? Owl Bell Legacy, whatever it is. The book, the book of the law. Um, uh, yeah, it. Uh, <laughs> I had it in my notes here just moments ago. Um, but yes, I, I believe I believe that is exactly what that is. And yes, the, yes, I do. It, the 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 year nineteen forty seven, as you are describing it, and as Steve Quayle has talked about it and written about, it, amazing uh, correspondence in itself that has to do with major, well, grid points on Earth as well as other places. The number nine, various other biblical and mystical numerology, and as it relates to even today, the oh my goodness, what's what's going on in the emails and what's going on in in Hollywood and in the highest levels of government? Um, oh yes, yes, yes. And, well, and 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 uh, David Plan showed how that if you took the location and Steve might have to help me with this, but the location of the Roswell crash site, uh, it was it was directly related to the thirty third, which is a, a Masonic number parallel. If you do a straight line from that, it went right through the center of Mount Hermon where the Watchers descended. So there was some there was some very 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 powerful high level occultism here. Uh, and uh, so I know we got other stuff to cover. Let me just say this real quick. Um, Parsons believed that he and Hubbard had accomplished their task in these rituals, 1946. In fact, you can read Parsons' biography, and he preserves this celebratory statement regarding the embodiment of the whore of Babylon in a child. He didn't say where. He just said that a female child was conceived uh, and that she would be born nine months later. She was conceived in 1946, uh, and uh, he compared it to the Immaculate Conception. And uh, he said, she'll be born in nine months' time from now. His, he said, exactly, Babylon is incarnate on the earth today. She's awaiting the proper hour of her manifestation, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you can believe any of that magic, then you would believe that in 1947, a woman was born who would rise to international prominence, uh, and she would become an outspoken feminist, and she would have the political clout to influence, even guide the nations of the world. And so I'm just putting this out there. It's, it's, it's interesting that Hillary Clinton was born in 1947. She still offers the most promise, in my opinion, for identifying the through to Parsons' infamous ritual. She was considered by many to be the front runner in the 2006 national U.S. presidential election. But here's my point, Hillary Clinton. Was it just a coincidence that uh, top government assistants to her were involved with people practicing the very occult magic that was used in the Babylon working, in the Thelemic uh, religion, in the Aliaster Crowley religions, in the spirit inner religions, to incarnate a female child? Uh, when Hillary uh, was conceived and born, some of the people around her. I'm telling you, if you want to, if you want to add something to your investigation, and I know you are a licensed investigator, Doug, uh, look into that because it couldn't possibly be a coincidence. It would be so extraordinary that the people around her were practicing all this magic that was tied to the Babylon working, and the very year that she was conceived and born. Uh, I mean, if you put any stock in that religion at all, which of course they will. Here's one last little thought, and then I'll get past this whole Hillary thing, but. Uh, it appears right now today she's not going to be the president. Who knows if she'll be healthy enough to run the next time around in 2020. But if she does run, guess what? She'll be 72, the highest occultic number uh, in the stratosphere connected to the Watcher Sciences and the whole idea of the incarnation of the Whore of Babylon. And there it is. I would like to. Steve, hey, go ahead. Hey, Doug, I'd like to echo one other thing, Tom. When the Nazis were into their spiritism and Dietrich Heydrich and, and all the others who were deep in the Ananerbi and the occult, the Thule Society, everything that made Germany in those days seek answers from the occult, I literally had a very, very prominent special operations general tell me that he said, Steve, go watch the movie Hellboy. And in that movie, and I'm not telling people to watch it, I'm just telling you what he said. He said, what you see there was the actual, listen to this. The actual recreation of the first Nazi Stargate that they were able to, if you will, spiritually and mechanically, electromechanically, open up. Now, I don't recommend people see the Hellboy, but in 1947, that's the same year that we were at war with the Nazis in the South Antarctica, where their flying machines destroyed ours. And remember, the Germans themselves made the same statement, that it wasn't that they were brighter than the scientists in the West, it's that they had spirit help and supernatural help from other dimensions. When you see a man of Dr. Werner von Braun's uh, caliber of genius and intellect making that statement, it's time that people wake up and understand this. And again, here's, here's what is critical. For all those of you wondering why Tom and I are talking about this with Doug Hagman on this night, which is whatever, the 28th of November, 2016, is God said his people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. People have tried to spiritualize that. They've tried to conceptualize it. They've tried to marginalize it. They flat out deny it. But notice this, Tom, you made a statement. The occultists believe more in the Bible, not, not in redemption or in Jesus, obviously, that, but they do understand. They know how this plays out. I once saw a Satanist with horns implanted in his head up in Kalispell, Montana. Actually, it was whitefish. 
and he had a T-shirt saying, you're, and I think I said this on a show years ago, but he, the T-shirt simply said this, Christian, your time, Christians, your times are coming. And so, you know, obviously direct threat and implied. The blood of the innocents is so critical to these festering pustules of satanic wickedness that it has to be, again, primary and in, in, in front of everybody, what is happening in Acapulco right now used to be the, you know, party capital of Mexico. The drug cartels are now resorting to guess what? Beheading people and cannibalism and taking out hearts. Gee, that, uh, you know, Tom, don't you and I look at a bunch of codexes from the days of the Aztec and Inca and Maya, and what do they show? People taking out hearts. So this whole ritual symbolism that's taking place in Hollywood, I, I don't think you know the gentleman, but he's listening to the show tonight, I would guess. He told me that, he, and he's a producer of pretty big movies, I mean, you know, uh, really big movies. He says, Steve, I can't even sleep in the city. I have to go out in the valley and said, I have to put a Bible open, claim God's protection, cover myself with Jesus. His words, he said, it's not who is involved in Satanism, it's who isn't. And he said, if you aren't, you basically are booted out, and, and by the grace of God, there are Christians in Hollywood that are trying to make a difference, and actors and actresses, but to a large extent, the whole thing has been given over. So why this is critical is every thought formed, all the Illuminati, the globalists, the, uh, uh, if you will, telepresence of hell, and let's just, you know, I still think it would have been better to call it television, H-E-L-L-A vision, versus television or telescreen, but the point is, is that, look at, I, I went into a, a uh, Steve, uh, Steve uh, brother, 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 I, brother, I got to stop you there, man. Uh, we're, we're right up against it, but man, television is a good term in adding that book or that uh, to the book of Quailisms. Stay right where you're at, folks. We're gonna be right back. Steve Quayle and Tom Horn, uh, both men of just tremendous intellectual prowess. I mean, can you hear it? Can you feel it? Uh, my goodness, I'm so lucky to have them both on with us. Our guests, Steve Quayle and Tom Horn. Steve was in the middle of talking about television. And, 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 and <laughs> well, Steve, go ahead and continue, brother. Well, I'll finish it up and give it back to Tom. Uh, you know, if you look at, uh, like, Costco, I looked at the top 100 items being sold on Black Friday, and what an appropriate name, okay? And the deal is, is that I think 55 of the top items were all television sets, okay? I'll just start calling them what I nicknamed them. But what's fascinating, I want to throw this out to you, Doug, to Tom and everyone. You know, when we were being even in, in what would you say, indoctrinated in the world of television where basically Marshall McLuhan said uh, the medium is the message. It's not that the message will be carried by the medium. Imagine this. I'm going to leave you with this. I, I won't go any deeper right now. But imagine when all of those people are so enamored with their television sets when the announcement, the annunciation comes on and each man hears these entities in his own language and the television sets will open up to be portals. Now, I'm telling you something there, and that's all I'm going to say at this point, because that's all I have freedom to say. Imagine a 70-inch, your very own television portal, but you're not going to like what comes through it. Hey, Tom, I just sent you an email, and this is really good. This is one that you should answer. I, I don't know if you've had a chance to read it, but from Pastor Don. He said, will you comment on the John Podesta seeming obsession with alien disclosure being forthcoming and how that connects with the spirit dinner connections? Go ahead and take that one, if you wouldn't mind. This is critical, because I think I, think I know where Pastor is going with this, and I think that you can answer it, and it's, um, it will be a blessing to a lot of people. Well, let's just say, um, you know, that, that the portals are set to open. There is a great deception that is coming, and by this concerted effort at CERN in particular, and that's, you know, when you look at the book Abaddon Ascending, that's mostly, uh, you know, the kind of the primary focus, if you will. Why did Sergio Bertolucci, the science director at CERN, why did he say we are going to open a doorway and we are going to maybe send something through it, but he said something may come through from a parallel dimension into our reality, and he literally referred to it as unknown, unknown state. They're not even hiding the fact that they're trying to open a doorway, but then add to the fact that you've got CERN's own employees um, conducting what they called a parody of a human sacrifice in front of the god Sheba. Sheba being the god that destroys the molecular level and the, then reassembles the earth. So, so from the horse's mouth, they're telling us they're trying to open a doorway into a parallel reality. Soon, those televisions that you're talking about probably are going to come on, and uh, the whole world is going to stop in its tracks. You're going to have the Pope, Petrus Romanus. You're going to have the leader of the United States. You're going to have the leader of Britain. You're going to have the leader of the United Nations. They're all going to walk down into the well of the assembly of the United Nations, and they're going to say, we are in contact with an extraterrestrial intelligence. That's one way it might happen. The other way is suddenly we wake up, the whole world's paralyzed. We're kind of like Will Smith in that movie, you know, uh, Independence Day, where you don't even know what's going on. You walk outside, and all of a sudden the giant shadow of a giant craft 
is hovering over the top of Washington, D.C., and other major cities of the world. This would be an event that would literally stop the world in its tracks. And I have been one for a long time who believes that this is going to be part of Abaddon ascending, the appearance of the Antichrist, the man of sin, who at first is going to appear to be, you know, a savior. Uh, he's going to be the guy with all the answers to all of our problems. I don't believe it's going to be Donald Trump, by the way. I'm not listening to the mystical rabbis in Israel that are saying that, you know, the, the uh, numeric value of his name, uh, the gematria of his name, means Messiah. Uh, I'm going to probably go into some of that on the Jim Baker show here pretty quick here in a few days. But uh, so there's a kind of great uh, deception that's going on. But how does it how does it tie in then to to Hillary and the Podesta emails? Well, first of all, because the Podesta emails uh, between me and Josh Peck, and now it sounds like Doug and others, you know, we've been using uh, uh, systems that can scan those emails and pick up certain keywords. And we have found literally dozens of emails in which Podesta was communicating with people that are Roman Catholic, some of part of the Vatican, uh, others who, uh, you know, that work formerly uh, in uh, aeronautics, uh, and some of them who are just, you know, uh, you know, musicians or whatever. Uh, but there is a community, there is an occult community, and they're talking very um, intimately about how in the year 2017 we are going to be at official disclosure. How do we begin preparing people for official disclosure? So why are they talking about this as if it's a done deal? Uh, that's a mystery to me. This is something we're going to continue to investigate, but it is very much also connected to the opening of doorways and portals as Ali Aster Crowley and Marina Abramovic and uh, the Spirit Dinner people and all of these occultists. What they're trying to do really goes back further. It goes back to ancient Egyptian. It goes, it's the deepest part of the darkest part of Freemasonic belief that we are going to raise Osiris. And Osiris is going to take his place. Osiris is the Egyptian equivalent, if you will, to Apollo of the Greeks. And that's why when you look at the Great Seal of the United States, it talks about this day that's coming when there's going to be the dawn of a new world order. It, too, by the way, uh, has encoded on it, and we've done whole shows on this before, that something began in the year 2012 that's going to reach its uh, finality in the Hebrew calendar year 5777, which is October of this year through September of next year. Are they right? I don't know, but they are definitely believers. These people completely believe that something is going to happen that is going to stop the world in its tracks. Now, here's, here's the, the bigger question. Probably at the core of the new book, Abaddon Ascending, is the question, if Abaddon is going to rise from the underworld, you look at the book of Revelation, the whole world, Stevie said a moment ago that, the, that people are going to freeze in their tracks, the whole world, it, it says, is going to wonder. They are going to be stopped in their tracks when he that was, and is not, is also going to be again. When he rises up from out of the underworld and takes his place in the person of the Antichrist, um, how does that resurrection science work? This was one of the questions that we deal with in the book Abaddon Ascending. And very quickly, I should say, uh, thank you, Doug, for mentioning that you went to TV.com, clicked on it, went into the store. That has not been connected to the store until just before I came. Because we are in a countdown, we're counting down to December 6th, this will be the biggest giveaway in the history of our company, but I decided that because I was going to be on the Hagman Show, and we appreciate you guys so much and your audience, that we would actually unhide that so that people who are listening to this program can go there and get in the front of the line. But people need to know this. It isn't going to last very long. First come, first serve, while supplies last, $400 in free DVDs, Bible software, free books, audio sets, all this stuff. But, but I guarantee you that something of this scope is not going to be there very long. So if you're interested, you need to do it right away. Just okay. take your, just take, uh, Tom, just take your Bob and Maggie. They, they just ordered it, and uh, they're good uh, good friends of the program. And of course, you get more people. So just make sure. That well, anybody <laughs> anybody that orders it that's listening to your program is going to be okay. I have ordered train loads. Steve Coyle's been to my warehouse. He knows we have 20,000 square feet of pallet of this stuff. But, uh, but we don't really know what to expect this time. We've had major sales before, but we have never done anything like this. It could go crazy. It could melt down our servers. It probably will. My we brought in all kinds of extra yep. help. We don't know. Uh, but we did it. I'm glad to do it. People can give it away as Christmas gifts. They can keep it. They can resell it for all I care. Somebody emailed today and said, can I order 100 uh, instead of one? And I said, yeah, just whatever. But it's still, it's only while it lasts. Okay. So I just want to say thank you uh, for saying that. But people need to know that just because you said that doesn't mean if they're listening to this program in three weeks from now that that's going to be up there. Um, so, But anyway, this great big question. How does resurrection science work? This has always been something interesting to me, and I use the term science kind of really loosely because we may be talking about physics, we're probably talking about metaphysics, but it's still something that employs both supernaturalism but also dynamic law because God used particles in physics to create. That's why they called you know tongue and cheek. That's why they called the Higgs boson uh, the God particle because they're trying to understand what gives mass. Blah blah blah. And you're going to have um, 
you're going to have Josh Peck, as I understand it, on the program in a couple of weeks from now. Sure. Yes. And he's the guy to ask all these complex questions about physics, not me, right? But, but the point is, how do they return? And does it involve gateways, doorways? Now, again, I can't let the cat out of the bag, but there were real reasons why me and Steve Quayle, his film crew, and all of us were in the Four Corner area of the United States recently. And we'll be back to this now in a month from now or six weeks from now, whenever we can start talking about it. But people need to, they need to make a note of this. Put in, put, take one of them little yellow post notes and put it on your computer screen that says, keep listening to Tom Horn and Steve Quayle, because th- this is going to be the biggest thing we've ever done in terms of answering this question about gates, doors. Not only how do they come back, uh, when they are going to come back, uh, wait, and, and, and are... And is it starting to happen now? Let me just put it that way. So, so note that. Now, in between, so here we go. Uh, how does resurrection science work? In between the so-called first incursion, I don't know if I like that term. A lot of people use it, but let me just use it because people are familiar with it. The first incursion of giants. Now, these are the uh, uh, antediluvian giants. These are the pre-flood giants. And Steve Quayle's masterful documentary. The second documentary Steve put out, I just couldn't. I, I watched it basically and said, "I'm done as a filmmaker." It is the best, without doubt. I'm not. I'm not saying it's the sell video. I'm telling you, I swear, this is the truth. The, the documentary that Steve Quayle has out right now, number two in his series, is without doubt better than anything that History Channel or any of those people have ever even dreamed of making. It was the best documentary I've ever seen, and I immediately went public and said that when I saw it. But his, it deals with this first incursion, these, these, the, the first giant. And the cover-up of the evidence for the megalithic builders of the, the first giants uh, who were here, and a lot of the stuff that goes on, that's going on, Peru, all these places. Um, and then, so, but in between that incursion, and then the prophesied future return of these hybrid monstrosities, which is biblical, there is what some people call the second incursion of, uh, now, call them what you want, Nephilim, Anakim, Giborim, even Nimrod, the builder of Babel, uh, this post-flood presence of giants. Um, is confusing to a lot of people because Second Peter 2.5 talks about how all the ungodly were destroyed in Noah's flood. Genesis 7 confirms all the souls of those on board the ark killed in the deluge, including the original uh, Nephilim. So how did the giants come back after the flood? This is really kind of a central question in theology. How did they come back? Uh, and, and is it related to metaphysical gateways? Well, some people believe that the answer to that question uh, is that uh, different watchers, repeated the original sin of the angelic, uh, of their angelic brothers after the flood, uh, giving birth, in other words, to a second crop of Nephilim. And there are Hebrew scholars that look at the, the phrase in Genesis 6, 6 one two, when men begin to multiply, and they say that that can accurately be translated, not just when, but whenever, meaning, in other words, this is something uh, that could be repeated, and that Genesis 6-4 might imply that when it says there were giants in the earth in those days, that is, before the flood, and uh, also after that, Moses writes, meaning after the flood. So this is a, a, a repeatable sense. Uh, uh, now, if that's how the giants return immediately after the flood, I'm not saying I believe that. I'm saying if that, if that theory is right, then it would kind of make sense that a lot fewer were generated the second time around because uh, the watchers would have been aware of and feared the judgment that had befell the original watchers. And so very few of them would have been crazy enough to do it again because the first ones are confined in everlasting chains in the darkness, according to you. Now, now there's a second more intriguing possibility, and we go into this in Abaddon Ascending. Um, uh, about, uh, and this one involves the cultism, so I'm kind of trying to slowly get back to answering this pastor's question about how this is involved with the Podesta emails and all that. Um, high-level magic may have been used to raise the dead Nephilim back into bodies of flesh. Um, there is a point where Steve and I, in the coming year, are going to go into this further than we've ever gone before. And not just because I'm going back to the house of the temple to meet with 33rd degree Freemasons. Uh, I've already confirmed a lot of that in a Polyon Rising. Um, but, but there is reason to believe that the cultists may possess um, uh, antediluvian watchers information that survived the flood. I'll go into that in a second. Uh, now, I, I, and by the way, I understand that people are listening to this and they're saying, forget it, the guy's lost his ever-loving mind. <laughs> it's too impossible to believe. There could possibly be magic, right, that somehow occultism, watchers level, angelic technology, that could reanimate the dead giant. But so let me just let me just share this. According to the book of Jubilee, 
Uh, and the Book of Jubilees is considered to be canon by some Orthodox churches, and also the Jews love it. Uh, but according to Jubilees 8, 1 through 5, I'm not going to quote this whole thing. People can go and read it. But Canaan, no one's grandson, he finds the antediluvian secrets of the Watchers after the flood. And then he hides that information because he knows it'll make uh, Noah mad. But it contains the teachings of the Watchers. This is the information that modern 33rd degree level uh, Freemasons claim to be in possession of. Uh, but so did Alia, I think. Now, Ali Aster Crowley did, never admitted it, but a lot of the stuff that he talked about in the Salima religion smack of possession of uh, the Watcher's knowledge for the purpose of these blood rituals and the other things that they did to reanimate uh, uh, dead Nephilim. By the way, um, uh, Steve, I can't go into this yet, but Ali just uncovered some Smithsonian-level research that talks about the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, cannibalizing of the Anastase for the express purpose of the individuals who are participating in these occult rituals, which Dr. Don Mose told us about, it changes them. It rewrites their DNA, and it allows them to become fit extensions for the reanimation of the giants. This is something that Timothy Alberino in Peru is, is crashing at the surface of, where they know where the graves of the giants are, and the children of the Peruvians, some of them, will go and they'll lay down at night, part of their, their masculinity rituals, their growing up rituals, when they're coming of age, so that they can absorb the energies of the dead uh, Nephilim. Um, in any case, Spirit of the Watchers. But remember, Steve, when we did um, the, the programs in which we talked about the magic bracelet? Um, yeah, the Cassetot. Yeah. So I think that the secret teachings of the Watchers that was recovered by Cana could have contained a formula for raising the spirit of dead Nephilim in use with these magic band, uh, uh, bracelets, these magic bands, also magic bed. Um, and that's, of course, if Jubilees can be uh, believed. But why do I think that there could be some credibility there? Because the Bible itself seems to allude to the efficacy of that ancient dark, dark art. Uh, if you, if you uh, uh, read the book of Ezekiel, I'm trying to find it here, Ezekiel, Ezekiel uh, 13, 8, here's what, it's 18, here's what it says. It says, will you haunt the souls of my people? And will you save? Now, this is the Hebrew kaya, which means to restore to life. Will you restore to life? the souls alive that come unto you, to slay the souls that should not die, and to save, there it is again, restore to life, the souls alive that should not live. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against your kathetot, that's the word in the Hebrew, your magic band, which were used for binding and loosing souls. I'm against them, wherewith you hunt the souls to make them fly. Now, this is the Hebrew word parak, which means to fly away, but alternatively, it can mean this, get this, to sprout up from out of the ground. And I will tear them, he's talking now about the bracelets again, I will tear them from your arm, and I will let those souls go, even the souls that you hunt to make them fly. So, the, and that's Ezekiel 13, 18 through 20, if people want to read that. The Kasetot was this magic armband that was used in connection with a container called the Keith. But this text in Ezekiel is interesting in the context of the upcoming research between me, Steve Quayle, and literally dozens of people, and the film crews, uh, and also the book Abaddon Ascending and the current uh, uh, documentary. When you combine that with the biblical idea of binding and loosing. Um, okay, it's almost 8 o'clock. I'm getting drugged down here. I want to go into Job 38. Well, here, let, let, me, let, me, let me say something, Tom, to kind of give you a rest and let you re, regroup. I, I, Doug, I think people have got to understand something. How can we, Tom Horn and I, and Tim Alberino, who's the younger version of us, you know, thank God he's half my age and, and got 20 times the energy, but, and, and he's done a marvelous job, but he speaks the language and has lived in Peru, and I'm hoping that people will understand something. Now, I want to share something. Because people have been asking, you know, they want to go on some of these expeditions, True Legends is putting together a VIP expedition and conference, and it's going to be uh, June the 11th through the 18th in Cusco, Peru. And I'm going to twist Tim's arm to maybe share. I, he's never done it publicly, and, and, and I think I've referred to it once, but if you were to hear his testimony, it's probably one of the most remarkable testimonies of salvation from a PK. He was a preacher's kid who literally went to the most remote part. I mean, the guy is born in uh, Cleveland, I think. And then the thing is, he goes to the remote part of uh, the Amazon to find and meet the Lord in, in, in uh, his wilderness experience. Well, God, obviously, in those years, formative years in Tim's life, uh, put him in contact with a lot of different individuals, and the stories he tells about the things that go on in the jungle, where there are jungle spirits, and literally uh, uh, the, the 
the encounters he had are just actually mind-blowing. But uh, let me put this this way. We're limited to 20 guests. It's going to be a five-star expedition. We're going to Cusco. I'm going. I'm going to be one of the speakers. Anselm P. Rambla, who's featured in the Unholy Sea, one of the most famous uh, archaeologists in the uh, world when it comes to underground tunnels, civilizations, etc. Tim's going to be talking, and we're going to take people right into the heart of this. You know, obviously, uh, Oshantai Tambo, what we call pre, if you will, pre-flood architecture. This was the big giants. Uh, fascinatingly enough, the, the late David Flynn, and I hate to call him late because I, I know that when I speak of David, I speak of him always in the contemporary uh, you know, uh, realm because his work lives on. Obviously, he's already in heaven with the Lord, but his work is a living work. It's a living revelation. And I want to say this about David. I knew him personally. I obviously uh, met with him in, in Helena. He came to Bozen. We would talk for hours. And to say this, that one, one afternoon session with him is like your mind mind melts, and, and uh, to that God gave a gifting. But I also believe that God did with David Flynn until David's time was up to go to be with the Father. I believe God gave him a time-sealed revelation, and the time-sealed revelation has everything to do with the Altiplano uh, in Peru and Bolivia, and also so much of the stuff Cusco. David's the one that basically proposed that there was a language, and it would have had to have been written by fallen angels, literally inscribed into the geoglyphs that Tim and I, uh, 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 basically, Tim went down there and filmed and we produced The Unholy Sea, which is the DVD number two, and True Legends, uh, the first one. But I, I guess what I want to tell people, we've already got 50% of it, so we've already got 10 people lined up. It's limited to 20. And if they want to uh, take a look at the conference and understand what we're doing, it's truelegendsoftheseries.com. You must, and I say this not because, quote, we did the DVD, but you must get a hold of those DVDs and be following us, because just as David Flynn left his fingerprints on the, the research that we're now building off of and referring to, especially his book, uh, Cydonia, The Secret Chronicle of Mars, uh, uh, the thing that, that people have got to understand, that Cusco is where it all begins. It's where Sir Francis Bacon literally called it the navel of creation. It's where the, the, the uh, Shinkana, the underground tunnel system, it's where all of the giants who built the massive structures, it wasn't built. By the way, no place in Aztec, Inca, or Mayan writing do they claim they built anything that they inhabited. They came in, they talk about the giants that came from the east, the blonde-haired giants. There are codexes, illustrative drawings of literally even the uh, Aztecs, and the Incas, and the Mayas, different uh, uh, indigenous tribes there, sacrificing blonde-haired, fair-skinned men on their sacrificial altars and tearing their hearts out. Uh, it's on my website today on the Vikings uh, coming into South America. So history as you know it is a scam. So go on truelegendsoftheseries.com. It's first come, first served. It's going to be, I think, a, an opportunity of a lifetime to not only see it, but remember this. Once you begin to take the first step, you'll begin to uh, go on a trek of understanding. And I, un I know that not everybody can go so that we're going to have a film, a small film crew there to be able to bring you the highlights uh, of the trip and stuff. But this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So please, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who want to go, go on truelegendsoftheseries.com. You'll see our VIP expedition and conference. It's going to be, you know, six days in country and probably with the most remarkable findings by one of the most remarkable archaeologists in the world and some of the most uh, in-your-face giant cyclopean architecture that is scaled so far above and beyond normal human capabilities. Steve, so, again, okay. True Legends, True Legends of the Series. The series. Yeah, All right. True Legends of the Series. Com. One minute. We'll be back. Stay right where you're at. Steve Quayle, go ahead, sir. Continue on with your, uh, and, and you can kick it over to Tom anytime you'd like. Yeah, I'll kick it immediately over to Tom, but I, I guess, you know, the thing we want everyone to understand is this. There is an acceleration taking place. The acceleration is Jesus said the time, the, the days would be shortened. as a shortening of days in order that his people, the believers, might be saved. Now, I'm not talking about salvation eternally. I'm talking about literally from this present age. So, when when Tom and I take all the different threads, and we whether it's the aliens, whether it's the giants, whether it's genetic engineering, I'll go, I went on record uh, 10 years ago, Tom, you and I were on the same show talking about the Human Genome Project had nothing to do with just identifying the human genome. It was literally to identify the genome, the fallen angel genes from the Nephilim, i.e. Rephaim, and basically be able to re, uh, how should I say this, reanimate the genetic code of those entities so that the evil spirits, the demons, could basically come back into their house and say they're back. And so I, I don't think people grasp what we're getting. So why is this important, Doug? Why is this important, everyone listening? Because God is is accelerating the time. The evil's becoming, and I want to make this, and I'm going to turn right over to Tom. I am on record as saying, I believe that the majority of these people that you see in entertainment, 
in the political arena, etc., are no longer human as you would define a human being. I believe they have been given over to such evil impregnation and uh, activation that outside of God literally setting the Jesus, setting the gathering demoniacs free, that's what you're dealing with. Can a whole nation become demon-possessed? Well, it looks like Mystery Babylon, you know, has become a habitation of devils. And obviously Hollywood or Hollywood and Hellivision and what's getting ready to uh, be unleashed. You see, these people are doing, and again, they're sacrificing your children, my children children, our children, because we're all members of the same body. That's what my Bible says. And when kids disappear and end up as pizza items on the menu, and John Podesta and these people are openly having their secret talk, it, it is stated in the background of what I've been told, there are in excess of 70,000 world leader, millionaire, billionaires involved in this. 70,000. We're going with what Tom Horn said. My guess is 72,000. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't even uh, put it past them to limit it to 72,000, because that manifests or corresponds with the 72 Goetic Gates. Don't go looking that up, but the demon portals entering into our dimension. CERN is the master lock. And isn't it amazing, ladies and gentlemen? Do you know how they see what they see? They see it on the screens. All their computer screens are tracking all of these entities. You know what they put in front of their target area? Glass plates with different languages. I got news for you. What we're talking about tonight is so relevant that literally men's hearts will fail them for fear of looking after those things coming upon the earth. But you do not have to be fearful. As a Christian, you can say, Lord, this stuff really scares me. I've said that. It upsets sets me. God, how can I deal with it? I have a hard enough time dealing in this realm with stuff I got to deal with. And God says, my grace is sufficient. But remember my promise, Steve. Remember this, everyone, that Jesus said he gives you the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Do you know why? The left, the lunatics, the demonetics, and the, uh, you know, blank heads, I'll let you fill in the word that precedes heads. Now, I'm saying this, not Tom, so get mad at me, not him. They, they will not use the name of Jesus because they know they have a time for their eternal, uh, if you will, damnation. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, well, you mentioned 72. If somebody visits the dome, uh, the U.S. Capitol Dome in Washington, D.C., you walk in, you look up, you see the apotheosis of George Washington where he's becoming uh, a god, the heaven he's ascending into. There's no Jesus, there's no crosses, there's no angels. It's all demonic gods. Uh, but notice right beneath that, what do you see? 72 pentagrams that go around the circumference just below the apotheosis of George Washington because they know that they have to be able to control these 72 demons according to their Gnostic belief. And they're very much connected to the Raphaim. You mentioned the Raphaim. And earlier, uh, I lost my train of thought because I was trying to uh, track too much on the question that that pastor had. Um, and uh, But I was trying to answer the question, how do they come back? And I kind of got lost in that. But the third point, this is something that we cover uh, in the book, Abaddon Ascending, so if people get that, they can read it to get all the details. But it's this point, that there is, uh, I, and this one is the one that's almost most intriguing to me, about how do the giants come back? How do these gates operate, Steve? How does what we have seen and documented and are filming uh, and are being told that the reanimation is beginning, how does this all function? Um, to incarnate these giants, these gods in the bodies of flesh, appears to be connected to magic beds. Now, I know this sounds kind of boring, but hang on with me for a moment. And fertility rituals, such as the giant bed of the king uh, Og from Deuteronomy. His bed Nine by four cubits, uh, conservatively at six by 13. Other people say the measurement's actually 18. Kind of depends on how you look at the cubit. And by the way, Steve, how do you translate that? I'm sorry, Tom, what, the, the length of a cubit? Yeah, well, the, the, the Og's bed. How long do you think Og's bed was? Well, I know that there are those that disagree with me, but in all, of, all the stuff I've come up with, I've come up with 18, and I think it's interesting because it's 3, 6, 18 feet, okay? okay? So, you know, they say, well, are you using a standard cubit or a royal cubit? I say, well, guess what? The cubit length is determined by the usage of all the stuff I've turned up. So, you know, 18 feet is what I go by, and people say, well, that's not true because so-and-so says that's not true. Well, I got news for you. So-and-so didn't write the myths, legends, and the oral traditions around it, so I'm, I hope I'm answering your question. Well, yeah, you are, because some people, well, some people say 13, that's still a giant, right? But some say 18, depending on how you uh, identify the cubit. Anyway, bottom line is, that King Og's bed, um, in more recent years, an identical bed to his, absolutely down to the millimeter, was found at the ziggurat at Amanonki, which a lot of archaeologists believe is the Tower of Babel. Um, and, and, but what's more important is at, at Amanonki, at the Tower of Babel, there was relief information which described how the bed was used. And this bed uh, was used as a ritual bed where the
where the god Marduk and his divine wife, uh, Zarpanitu, would meet annually for their ritual lovemaking. The purpose of that was procreation, uh, blessings upon the earth. Some people want to say it was only, you know, uh, fertility ritual, uh, and that it didn't play a role in anything other than symbolic fertility ritual. But Marduk's wife's name, Zarpanitu, is actually interpreted as creatress of seed. And it's associated with literal fertility, possibility of the ancient idea of divine birth, and the Proto-Evangelium out of Genesis 3.15. Remember, I will put enmity between thy seed and the seed of the, of the uh, woman, so, uh, or the seed of the serpent. So the, the, this Marduk ritual appears to have been uh, specifically connected with a giant bed for the purposes of fulfilling what Ezekiel was talking about, the raising of the Raphaim from the underworld, the dispelling of the soul of an individual so that they could be trained, changed, transmogrified. It, it's exactly the same thing, Steve, that you and I are learning from the Four Corners area and what was going on with the Anasaze and this idea that through cannibalistic rituals, they weren't cannibalizing because they were starving, they had food, they were cannibalizing for a different purpose. And by conducting these rituals, some of which came about in Mesoamerica, Quetzalcoatl, Kukulkan, the worship of this dragon feature, of this dragon individual that came through this portal in the Four Corners area of the United States, such as we chronicle, um, taught them dark magic, dark rituals. In their kibas, uh, there at the San, I might as well name it the San Canyon Pueblo, the people that turned us down. First degree, they would meet with us, then they turned us down. But in the kibas there, the partly what they're not wanting people to discover is in those kibas were the same teeth and the same finger bones, kiba after kiba, where they were practicing what Dr. Don Moses said, witchcraft. To put a better term on it, pharmakia, which is how the New Testament book of Revelation chapter 9, for instance, describes how these gateways open, how these doorways open. Isn't it amazing that in Revelation 9, this angel comes down, he opens the bottomless pit, Abaddon ascends up out of the pit, all of these horrific beings, but the very people that are being tortured, in the last uh, two verses of that text, it says, and yet they repented not of their sorcery. And this is the term pharmakia. Pharmakia is the, is the use of magic and incantation, such as the Podesta emails are describing, for the express purpose of circumventing God for what purpose? To make contact with those things that are on the other side of these stern mystical doorways. And, and so it's almost as if God in Revelation 9 is saying, you asked for it, you got it. The gates are open, and yet they repented not of their pharmakia. So this bed of Og was discovered at the Tower of Babel. Uh, I mean, this bed identical to the one of Og was discovered at the Tower of Babel, but it indicates that Og and his ilk, uh, the Anakim, the giant, the living versions of the later dead Raphaim, uh, were practicing some, something that the Watchers had taught them that is lost to us today except perhaps for these deeply occulted individuals and the Freemasons who claim that they still have the power. They conduct, actually, the raising of Osiris ceremony. Now, uh, again, this is kind of interesting in light of the Scripture because people hear me talking about this and they, and they might think, well, this is just a bunch of hope. This can't happen. It can't really happen even though Ezekiel might have, you know, Ezekiel was wrong, God was wrong, it can't happen, you can't dispel, dispel. you can't change a person's DNA and dispel their spirit and then create a living receptacle into which the Raphaim can rise, even if Ezekiel is talking about that, it can't happen, it can't possibly happen, people can't believe this, right? And yet these beds appear to have been used to do uh, that very thing, archaic magic performed for the express purpose of raising the mighty ones to life again, this is literally at the core of some of these ancient themes, Egyptian and otherwise. Now, I, I think maybe that's why the uh, Dewey Reams version of the Bible translated uh, Isaiah 26, 14, in which he's actually praying when he says, let not the dead live, let not the giant rise again. Now, here's another thing I'll say real quickly, because I know we'll, in 10 minutes here we'll be at the bottom of the hour again. Og uh, was said to be uh, the last of the Raphaim. Now, this term Raphaim is connected to the Anakim and other ancient giants, but it has this idea of these giants in the underworld and the possibility that they have the ability to somehow rise to physical form at particular moments in time. And this relationship between the Raphaim and the giant occupants of Canaan, of which Og, the king of Bashan, belongs, and the Nephilim is important here as this Raphaim is associated by the ancients with the shades of the dead, the, the dead Nephilim in Sheol Hades. The, in fact, the meaning of the word Raphaim uh, carries with it the ideal to heal or to be healed, as in a resurrection from the place of the dead, Sheol Hades. And in the Rosh Hashanah text, these Raphaim are described as demigods 
who had worshipped the Amorite god Baal, the ruler of the underworld. And when these Raphaim die, they go down into the underworld, where they join Baal's acolyte assembly of lesser gods, the kings and heroes and rulers. And these beings have the power to return from the dead through, I don't, I, I don't like the word reincarnation, because that's not really what we're talking about here, magic. It's actually more akin to the Podesta email, but they have the ability to rise up from the underworld through occult magic and to become reincarnated. And I think it's a surprise to a lot of Bible students that will be when they read Abaddon Ascending to learn that the prophet Isaiah may have actually considered that dogma uh, factual uh, when he tied the power of those beings to the king of Babylon and Lucifer himself after prophesying against the Babylonian leader. And he says, hell, uh, that is Sheol Hades, from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead. It stirreth up the dead. The Rapha, the Raphaim, that's the dead there. Uh, uh, even all the chief ones of the earth, it has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. And they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we art thou become like unto us? So Isaiah uh, uh, 14. But it was immediately after that statement that Isaiah looks beyond the Raphaim at their bail. Uh, in verse 12, when he says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So th- these are very interesting places. Uh, Job 26, 5, uh, dead things are formed from under the waters, and the dead in that text is Rapha. They are formed from under the waters. And this term, are formed, is full, which means to twist or to whirl a sieve in a double helix coil, as you mentioned a moment ago. Genetic manufacturing or genetic alteration, genetic reengineering. And, and, of course, we've done... Or whole genetic program. reanimation. Yep, it's genetic, genetic reanimation. reanimation. Yeah. So, uh, and, of course, again, Revelation 9, Revelation 17, tell us that the ultimate king of the Nephilim is going to rise. So whether or not somebody buys this idea that, you know, the, 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 the witches of Eastwick behind the Podesta emails are trying to practice something because they were true believers that Hillary Clinton was somehow connected to the Babylon working, whether or not people buy any of that at all, I think there's a lot of reason to be suspicious here, that these people were behaving in a way that they had totally bought in to this occultic magic. Uh, we might even want to ask ourselves if maybe God has only temporarily, uh, through the uh, Trump presidency, has only temporarily given us a moment so that the church would become preachers of the gospel again. Maybe there could be a great awakening. Uh, because I think if we had never known, if the WikiLeaks scandal had never happened, if we had never known this stuff was going on, it was kind of like before your friend Alex Jones took a, a British filmmaker and they cre- you know, crept inside the, 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 the Redwoods and filmed... Yeah, know, the Bohemian Grove. The Bo- and before that happened, who would have believed, right? Who would have believed that the president of the United States, the British leadership, and that all these elite from around the world were coming to, to, to go in, you know, inside the Redwood Forest in front of a 40-foot-tall giant owl to conduct rituals for X number of days. Who would have believed that would ever happen? We wouldn't, but we'd say it's like a B-title movie. It's never happened. Well, it was happening. Now we know, as a result of, of this email release, that it, something very much darker was happening, and it does seem to be connected to an effort to bring about the culmination of the resurrection of he that was and is not and yet shall be. There are people who are intentionally working now to try to create, uh, 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 you know, an invitation. Uh, again, you know, go to go to Google, watch the uh, the uh, uh, tunnel ceremony, uh, and and how spooky it is, and note the invitation for them to call forth these these goat-headed demons from the underworld to bring about this king of the world who will be this goat-headed Fernunos or whatever. Um, uh, it's some very, very spooky and concerning stuff. Uh, well, Tom, I think, let me let me interrupt you because, uh, not interrupt, let me just give you an attenuation on what you're already saying. Years ago, the BBC did carry the news article that Gilgamesh's tomb had been found. Mm-hmm. After that issue, and, uh, you know, it may be interesting for you to, you, if, well, I don't know how much time we've got. we got a little bit of time, but they, I was told by the people that, that, their number one goal in the world of black ops, black ops, again, with no names, no official sanctions, but they go and track down, if you will, the monsters, the things that go uh, bump in the night, that uh, extricable DNA was taken from Gilgamesh. Now, some people believe Gilgamesh, obviously, is another name for Nimrod. 
So the thing is, in the Gilgamesh epic, obviously he goes into hell, he goes into the underworld. But isn't it fascinating that now we've got the world leaders, at least at the, uh, quote, bottom of the earth, not, by the way, the side of a parallelogram or a triangle, that's my uh, statement to that, not at the uh, bottom of the dome. But they're meeting with someone and entities that seemingly control that which goes on the surface of the earth from under the earth. You don't get the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, you don't get the Pope, you don't get Obama, you know, all these guys and carry down there. And and it's not about, you know, making sure penguins procreate properly. It's about somebody's meeting with someone down there. And what's fascinating to me is is that now they hit the uh, history channel hunting Hitler, and it's it's becoming more and more apparent. People, I get a lot of hate mail when I say this, but they can't deny the history of the occult and the supernatural ritual magic that the SS undertook. And the SS stands for Schwarzensone, that basically, and I apologize for my poor pronunciation of German, but the Black Sun movement. The Black Sun is the sun in the inner earth. That's the area that Bird went to. People say, ah, oh, he was crazy. Well, if Admiral Byrd was crazy, ask yourself this. Why did someone murder Secretary of Defense, the first Secretary of Defense, Forrestal, and throw him out a third-story window at Bethesda uh, uh, Naval Hospital when he wanted to go public and tell people about the aliens and what was truly underneath the ice, the empire beneath the ice? Well, how does that all evolve? It's, you know, dead things are moving. And I believe this. I believe that the, the ancient uh, scriptures, and obviously the word Rapha, you probably know this, but Rapha and Rephaim, there are 33 mentions of that. Isn't that fascinating? Mm-hmm. 33 mentions. The word Nephilim appears twice, Genesis 6 and Numbers 13, 33. The word Nephilim never appears after that, but the Rephaim or Rephaim and then the Rapha appear 33 times. So there you've got that, again, you've got that occult signature on the very word that they're trying to reanimate, and especially those who are, uh, are how do I say this, uh, working overtime to reanimate all of their children. You know, this is something that was explained to me, and I never thought about this, but the fallen angels, not the ones that were bound in everlasting chains of darkness, those are the ones that I believe landed on Mount Hermon, the original 200, but after that, even the second incursion, or the second time that they corrupted the DNA, obviously that's where Goliath came from, but the the fallen angels are doing their best to reanimate their children. And that, boy, when that hit me like a ton of ten, uh, 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 bricks. In other words, they want their evil children back. And someone says, well, what do you do when a giant uh, uh, comes out of uh, stasis or suspended animation? Won't they be hungry? And I said, and I, I guess it sounded sarcastic, yeah, and anybody in sight is on the menu. Because I've been told that of the first thing that in Dulce, the infamous uh, alien wars under Dulce, New Mexico, when they had an outbreak of the giants. That, now, I'm talking about living giants, not bones, not test tube babies, okay, big test tubes. But I'm talking about a literal outbreak of giants. And that the scientists who were there by, you know, U.N. treaty or something, these, the guy said, well, the first thing the giant, that, the one that they ultimately had to put down, he said the titanium bars, and he said they have other metals in their bars. The bars that hold these things are like, you know, a couple feet in diameter, each of the bars. And then they have some other, you know, metals in them, I guess is copper, but the point being, the first thing that thing did when it broke loose, this is a living giant in an underground military base in New Mexico, a, was, when he broke loose, he basically slaughtered them all and just engorged himself on them all. Steve, now, that, say, well, that's that, 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 yeah. uh, hang on, Steve. you got to finish that on the other side. It's fascinating. Hagman and Hagman Report. Steve Quayle, Tom Horn. We're going to be right back to where we're at. Steve, the giant, I, I, I'm just trying to envision what you were talking about. I mean, seriously. Really, uh, breaking through. Yeah, well, go ahead. It, it is really hard to understand it, but look, God's going to give us a revelation unfolding. It's like Corey Ten Boom's story that her dad told her. God gives you, you know, when you're ready to get on the train, the loving father gives you the ticket at the time you get on the train. And I know some of the stuff, like I'm getting emails, how do we kill? But I, fortunately, the, the uh, uh, Hollywood producer that I was referring to, he just sent me an email, and I don't want to share his name without it, but let's just say this, you know, Mission Impossible 2, uh, you know, Mission Impossible 3, uh, uh, you know, very, very, very well-placed Hollywood insider. And I want to I want to read this, Tom, because this will maybe illustrate in real time. Well, well, why? Excuse me. Well, while we are on the air, why it's so important. WWs get me. Dear Steve, you are correct. I'm listening to you guys on Hagman tonight. You guys are doing an awesome job revealing the dark underbelly of Washington and Hollywood. Since the election, listen to this. The actors who are practicing Satan worship have barely been able to prevent the demons who possess them from manifesting in public. They are so freaked out by Trump's election. In all the years of my deliverance ministry in Hollywood. 
I can never remember a more dangerous time. Now, here's what he goes on to say. By the way, ladies, this is the, the real McCoy. God bless you, Arthur. Uh, please be careful approaching. I'm sorry. No, he says, fortunately, the prayers of the righteous people protected Trump and the Lord. Now, this is this is important. The Lord gave us the leader we needed for this time and not the one we as a sinful nation deserved. And there seems to be a common thread, Tom and Doug, of the people, including us, who know that, if you will, God's prophetic timetable is absolutely full, full speed ahead. But he, because he's the creator, can say, I'm going to give these guys a time out to get their act together because there is none of us. There are None of us that are ready to deal with this stuff. It cannot be dealt with in a normal human mind context. It cannot be uh, battled against in a normal human battle context. And, you know, I get emails like, well, I'm just going to rebuke him in the name of Jesus. Well, show me where you're taking on the lion and the bear and winning before you go taking on Goliath. I've never seen so much assumptive faith instead of faith that produces results. So, Tom, just as we're on the air tonight, he said he, and, and this is what I call outpicturing. I want to share something. Those of you who are under the blood of the Lamb and have given your hearts to Jesus is one lot applied to you. Those of you who are playing games with God and have uh, the, the tattoos of nightmares, uh, you know, of, of demons, devils, Satan, all of the uh, strange things, get saved, get your life filled with the Holy Ghost, because just as I, I you know, Doug, I, I gave a release, I'm going to give it right over to Tom. I said something really powerful. I hope people understand it. I'm not the one that made that up. Imagine when your big screen TV becomes an active portal, and all the stuff that, you know, fills the airways, whether it's demonic, and, and look, I'm not, I, you know, I'm making DVDs and movies and stuff, but what I'm talking about is knowing the spirit behind something, and when the spirits that are being invoked by the people through ritual magic and through abandonment to Satanism, imagine when their tattoos become alive and those things burst out of their chest or off of their spine or out of their necks. And imagine when the, the very screen that you just bought a 70-inch TV or doesn't matter, a 7-foot or whatever, and imagine that there comes a time when literally that will be a true portal. And, and again, I've never said that, and I, I find, Tom, that there are certain things of revelation that God only releases uh, to me when we're on the air. For instance, you were the one that released on the air one time one of the very first shows we ever did, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Up until that point, I had zero understanding. Now, we're talking, what, 10, 15 years ago, but I think it's really critical to understand that people, we pray for these uh, presentations. The people around us are praying. The intercessors are interceding. Arthur says, I continue to pray warfare protection prayers for you and the other watchmen and women daily. Then my other, one of my other listeners, and, and you've met him, I won't tell you his name, but you've met him, Tom, you and I have both met him, he said this, guys, by far the best, most informative, most current and up-to-date show I've ever heard tells me everything that my wife and I have been reading and watching this past two weeks has not been for naught. Things are escalating, it is, uh, things are escalating exponentially. It's a shame hardly anyone sees what is coming. So Tom, go ahead and take it, if you want, just uh, take, go until you, you know, you get tired, but share with where you think uh, where you think we are in the time frame as far as disclosure, this is questions I'm getting, and manifestation. I, I hear it all the time my email or on the phone. Well, well, I'll believe it when I see it. And I said, yep, well, you might have a throat side view, meaning, you know, maybe when you're in the mouth of these things, just like, uh, uh, then you'll believe it. But tell us where you think at this point, because again, you're already, uh, about Abaddon Ascending is available, Skywatch TV, you've made the specials, but just at this point, what is what are your tires spinning over that you're going, wow, the things that, you know, the, the things that your mind just won't shut down on. Well, so let me say how much I appreciate your uh, your film producer, friends who's worked on the Mission Impossible film, um, and uh, and his comments and the other comments, uh, uh, you know, whoever it was that emailed you, somebody that you and I both know that have said it confirms what uh, him and his wife have been looking at over the last few weeks. And I'm sure that this is probably also true for a lot of people uh, out there. Uh, and I agree with the film producer who is, you know, he's in Hollywood, so he's kind of familiar with what's going on there. He probably was totally familiar with what I was talking about with uh, uh, Marina uh, Abramovic, uh, you know, the carving up of the bodies and eating that horrible, terrible stuff and how these Hollywood elite are applauding and clapping, and it was the most demonic thing I've ever seen. But uh, I do believe that we have been given a moment. And, and, and the truth is, Trump is the most unlikely candidate on the face of the earth. The man, look, I, 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 I will admit that I voted for him. I might, it might have been more that I was just voting against Hillary. Uh, I laughed and joked and said to some of my friends, I'm going to hold my nose and go in and vote. But then I've been doing that for a lot of years, right? <laughs> so, um, but, but, uh, but I don't see a, a, a political leader as really the answer to where we're going. I, it was more a civic duty. I'm a patriot. I do think, though, that there's something else here at work, and I do think that it is God who put the brakes on something. If people listen to the first two hours of this program and and, and I'm assuming if they listen to what Doug's going to be releasing uh, on the Hagman and Hagman,
Hagman report in the weeks ahead, his three or 400 pages of, of investigation, and Doug is a licensed investigator. Um, uh, there, I think that the nation was protected by God from something that the, uh, the average citizen can hardly appreciate, that we were on the precipice. Uh, we were literally about to step over into hell itself. Um, and God in his benevolence, God in his mercy, has given our nation, and more importantly, he's given the church an opportunity to be able to take this time now, not to sit back and say, good, I, pull, I, I pulled the voting lever and my dominionist effort has paid off and I've got my king now and so now I can relax. No, that's not what this is. This is now an opportunity for us as the church to become preachers of the gospel. When you read, first, uh, when you read Paul's epistle to Timothy, and people quote that where he said, pray for the leaders and kings, and normally they stop with that with their dominionistic approach in the church, Read, read the whole verses 1 through 4, where what he's describing is, uh, pray for your leaders so that you will have an environment that is not living under tyranny, so that you have uh, uh, the, an easy opportunity to be preachers of the gospel, an unrestricted opportunity to be preachers of the gospel, so that people can come to the faith, so that people can be saved. More than anything else right now, what God has given us is this opportunity to become preachers of the gospel. We all know, and Steve, you and I, and, and, and Doug, we did programs you know, a couple of years ago, blood on the altar, and where we were going, and, and what was happening with uh, the whole agendas that are coming down from the federal bureaucracy and more, dictating to the church what they can say or not say, who they can hire and not hire. All of a sudden now, we've been given this moment where, hopefully, Trump's going to follow through with what he has said. It's a reprieve, if nothing else, and we have a moment in time. But let me say one other thing about this. You know what this reminds me of? Uh, I'm a, I'm a child of the Age of Fire. I'm a child of the Jesus People movement, um, and I grew up in that whole environment. My brother's band played back up for Thirst, Santana, Rare Earth, Step in Wolf. I was in the middle of all this stuff, you know, Woodstock, all that. Um, and I remember how it was an organic thing. Uh, no big-haired evangelist came along and said, "Hey, let's start a new awakening called the Jesus Freak movement." That's that's not how this happened. The people were anti-establishment. They lost their faith in the government. They were against the Vietnam War. And, um, but we are wired to be submitted to a sovereign. God made us to want to be submitted to a sovereign, and that is him. Uh, when we get to a point where our faith is in government and we get up every day and we pray, dear Obama, uh, you know, uh, bless our daily bread and give us our, uh, you know, our daily bread, we become dependent on the government. But when people lose faith in the government, this is what's happened in Brexit. This is what's happened with uh, the Trump presidency where you have a moment in time now where people no longer believe in uh, the government, they don't believe in globalism, they're rejecting globalism, and yet, deep down inside, they still want to be submitted to a sovereign, so they turn back to God. That's what happened in the Jesus Freak movement. They're rebelling against the Vietnam War, you know, Nixon sending out the water cannons because they're marching on Washington, D.C., but out of that grew this, this organic, grassroots, uh, fifth great awakening, and literally millions of people came into the kingdom of God as a result. I, like I say, I was part of that. Sid Roth part of that. Jim Baker was part of that. Uh, Chuck Misler came out of that. The Calvary Chapel churches came out of that. It was a phenomenon. That's what I think we are right now on the precipice of. What I'm seeing is signs of another great awakening, and that's what I hope will happen. Now, let me, let me, now that I've shared the positive side, let me share the negative side of what I also see. Don't forget that uh, you know, other great awakenings were born out of great catastrophe. At the end of World War II, um, the the uh, uh, the Holocaust. People became aware of what had been going on with the Jews, and the church was dead and asleep. And the Zionist movement had not got its legs under it. But when the war came to an end, and people around the world began seeing what was happening in the gas chambers at Dachau, at Auschwitz, uh, suddenly sympathy from around the world rose up. Pressure was put on the United States, put on Britain, put on the United Nations, and they are the ones who then begin calling. Uh, for a, a Jewish state, a Jewish nation. And a miracle occurred. 1948, a nation was born in one day. But guess what happened? It was at that same time that the church suddenly saw a, the nation of Israel being born in one day. They translated that as the fig tree uh, blossoming out of the book of Matthew. <laughs> they translated it as Bible prophecy was unfolding right before their very eyes. And it gave birth to what we call today the Age of Fire. Uh, you know, all of these great preachers, Billy uh, Branham, A.A. A. Allen, uh, Catherine Kuhlman, all these people came up out of the Age of Fire and became preachers of the gospel, but that was born out of catastrophe. And here's what I think is also going to be part of where we are. If the Church will now respond 
to this moment they have been given and become preachers of the gospel while we still have the ease that Paul wrote to Timothy about when he said, pray for your national leaders. Um, then we may not need catastrophe. But if we don't, if people think that by pulling the voting lever they've done their duty and now we have our king and now the church can relax, then the second phase, the World War II example, might be what we face next, a terrorist uh, weapon of mass destruction, some catastrophic circumstances that would then put the church on its knees, on its faces, so it'll fulfill Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, God says, and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. This is where I think we are right now today. But we were literally moments away from the Podesta revelation. We were moments away from the Aliaster Crowley vision of the future, where human sacrifices are made, blood sacrifices are made, doorways are open. And I will tell you that if people think for one moment that, uh, you know, that we're, we're, we're kind of exaggerating at the fact, then they just don't understand what's going on in the world around us, what's going on at CERN, what was going on uh, with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Gothard uh, Tunnel revelation. Uh, we, there are very powerful occultists, but also scientists. And these are true believers. And they believe that they are going to open a dimensional doorway to other realities. That's why they're out there talking about it publicly. Sergio Bertolucci, the, the director of science for CERN, saying we are going to open a doorway. He's not saying we might. He's saying we are. And you can go and you can watch the, um, uh, there's, a, uh, there's actually, uh, oh, what is the guy's name? His last name is Green. Is it Brian Green? He's a really popular uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, physicist right now that's doing a whole lot of television for all these different uh, television channels. But, but anyway, he has a, um, a documentary right now there that you can go on uh, uh, YouTube and you can watch. It's a two-hour long documentary. If somebody wants to email me and ask me, I, I will get the email link. And, I mean, I'll get the YouTube link and send it to them. But he's talking about, uh, you know, so we're going to open a doorway. Then what? And this stuff, this is really spooky. It's secular science. And what he's saying is we are going to, uh, besides the Higgs boson, we are going to discover graviton the particle that gravity is made out of. We think we already have filmed at CERN when these uh, protons have been busted into their subatomic particles. We think we've already filmed gravitons escaping into a parallel reality because they're going somewhere. And matter doesn't just disappear. It, it's still there, but it's going away, and it, it is disappearing in the film. And now they're saying that, you know, it's a spring theory concept, but now they're saying they think that these uh, gravitons are in their own closed spring loop and that they can move back and forth between parallel realities. So who cares? So what? Here's so what. They literally say in the documentary film, if we can confirm that this is true, then gravitons become the methodology for us to set up communication between our reality, our universe, and another universe. We can string them together like computer code. We can literally create a message, and we can send it through to another reality to say we are here. And that's what Sergio Bertolucci meant when he said, we are going to send something through this doorway and something may come back. In other words, we're going to say we're here, and Steve, you've often said in the message that's coming back, that's coming back is saying, okay, thank you. We'll be there in a little while to eat you. Um, but, but we are literally developing science and technology right now to communicate with invisible entities. This is absolutely extraordinary. They're not even trying to hide it anymore. Uh, but, but when you look at what the occultists, uh, at, you know, at the Cothard uh, Tunnel Ceremony, the Satanist parody that was taking place at CERN, the, the Podesta emails, these people are telling us exactly what they're trying to do. And I think that God has suddenly worked a miracle and gave us a moment in time with the most unlikeliest of individuals. You know, Trump, bless his heart, he's the most inarticulate person I've ever seen. The guy can't put 12 words together. How in the world could he have been elected? Well, this must, I think, have been a God thing. Well, you know, we know from the Scripture God uses the foolish, uh, the foolish things to confound the wise. But also look at this. God used somebody, in my opinion, to that, that had no... Uh, uh, ties to the corrupt uh, uh, political slash Satanism. And I'll say this, on my position on this, and, and I, I only speak for myself, Tom, is that the entire political elite is given over to uh, perversion, with few exceptions, okay? I can even tell you some of the guys, and I won't name names, and I, you know, it won't do me any good to throw out what's, what I've been told, and you know, I won't slander anybody, but I'll tell you this, that the idea of, of where we're at in time with the uh, CERN and the glass panels. You know one of the languages they, they are communicating with? They're communicating with uh, Proto-Hebrew, 
According to, you know, a lot of research, uh, the tribe of Eber, E-B-E-R, were the only ones that didn't participate and, you know, in the building of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Tower of Babylon, and therefore God allowed them to maintain their pure language while everything else was, a, uh, you know, a spin-off, a takeoff, a distortion. But I find it fascinating that they're holding up panels in the target beam, uh, actually the holder in front of their focus point, if you will, uh, of uh, Proto-Hebrew, and they're communicating with something. Now, guess who would know that language? Now, also, I want to share something. Everybody I've talked to that's encountered the living giants, they have the ability to speak languages. You don't need to get an interpreter for a giant that's been in France or one that's been in Germany. The power of their mental faculties is so great that, uh, you know, there, there are ways, and I don't know those ways, or I'd, I'd spell my guts, but there are ways to deal with that and to protect it. By the way, it goes beyond aluminum foil. But the point is, is that we're now seeing the master lock. I don't know at what energy. Excuse me. I don't know at what energy level the lock spins. Everything opens up and all hell breaks loose. But I will say this: when the uh, CERN ceremony took place at Gotar, or however they pronounce it, the, it was obvious that it was a celebration of Lucifer's release onto the earth to bring the illumination and the ultimate persuasion and the ultimate uh, expression of total rebellion against God, hatred and contempt for humanity that will ultimately end in the words of Jesus. If the days weren't short, there'd be no flesh left alive. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how important this is. And just because a demon puts on a business suit, has glasses, and has a Ph.D. from wherever, doesn't make him any less of a demon. And when these guys are openly talking about, you know, the fact that they know exactly who they're trying to communicate with, and even today, weren't the parallel universe stories all over the London Daily Mail, the front of uh, Drudge? By the way, I want everybody to go to the front of Drudge, as Tom and I are coming to the end, and look at the Egyptian grave, 7,000 years old. Look at the size of the steps. And then look at the size of the skeleton, especially look at the femur and uh, uh, just the size of the relationship. They're disproportionate. That is one big skeleton they're claiming royalty. In order to be Egyptian royalty, you had to have the genetics of the giants, and that's what the Sumerian Table of Kings was all about. So when you said, Tom, it's a, the Egyptian priesthood, that is so, uh, or reference to that, that is so pertinent today on the front of Drudge. They're showing a grave, and look at the size of the steps down in the grave, and you tell me if that's an ordinary size. Skeleton. Well, I don't and, and think Steve, so. And Steve, I wonder how many people know that the town that the Large Hadron Collider CERN complex is situated in, St. Denis de Wheelie, uh, in ancient Roman times was known as Apollyacomp. This is the temple that was dedicated to Apollyon, and they believed that it was literally uh, the, the location of the bottomless pit. So ask yourself, is it just an astonishing coincidence that the Large Hadron Collider is located in the very place where a temple and a town were dedicated to the king of the bottomless pit, this angel who holds the key to the bottomless pit? Uh, so uh, one one thing I'll say real quickly here, because I know we're going to run out of time. Uh, one of the books we're giving away free in that $400 worth of books and product over there tonight is another brand new book, never been released before. It's called Final Fire, is the next great awakening right around the corner. And it goes into all the reasons why I believe that we've been given this opportunity and how this could be a prelude to another great awakening. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Michael Lake's new book, The She Reef Imperative, uh, he's been on with Hagman and Hagman before. His brand new book is also part of that. So. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing. If you're going to get Abaddon ascending, then you should get it there, get it now, because this is never going to happen again. Absolutely. Uh, hey, uh, it's so great to be on the air with you again tonight, Doug, with oh. you, Steve. You guys are so good. This has been a, a, an intriguing conversation, to say the least. Absolutely. And, and you, Tom, I'm, I'm, you and I are going to have to talk off air. Uh, I do have some things for you, and, and Steve, uh, same with you. But uh, Steve, uh, True Legends of the Series dot com uh, as well, and uh, Tom, of course. Abaddon ascending in, in your package. Marvelous both. Thank you so very much. We're out of time. God bless you both, man. Appreciate Good night, Doug. Good night, Tom. Good night. Good night, Steve. Thank you, sir. Good night, Tom. Folks, that'll do it for us tonight. The Hagman and Hagman Report. What a fantastic program. I hope you I, I, look, go back and listen to this again. The information that was shared, so relevant to what's going on today, so relevant to what happened in the past, in the recent past with the Nazis and in, in, in the ancient past. Um, my goodness. How great is this? God bless. Settle for battle. Thank you.